Welcome to Equine Assisted World. I'm your host, Rupert Isaacson, New York Times bestselling author of The Horse Boy, founder of New Trails Learning Systems and LongRideHome.com. You can find details of all our programs and shows on RupertIsaacson.com. Here on Equine Assisted World, we look at the cutting edge and the best practices currently being developed and established in the equine assisted field. This can be psychological, this can be neuro psych, this can be physical, this can be all of the conditions that human beings have that these lovely equines, these beautiful horses that we work with help us with. Thank you for being part of the adventure and we hope you enjoy today's show. Welcome back to Live Free Ride Free where we talk to people who are living self-actualized lives and we'll find out what can we learn from them. How can we help ourselves to self-actualize more, better, more fluidly, more joyfully, more happily, and also just their amazing life stories. And I've got someone rather incredible with me this week. I have Linda Kohanov, who many of you horsey folk out there will know from the Tower of Equus and her other books. Uh, but the Tower of Equus was the groundbreaking one that I think brought to everybody's attention at the start of the 21st century, really a new paradigm for looking at the experience of horses through a very, very different lens and how that could help in one's life, not just within one's equestrian sphere. For those of you who do not know, who are not horsey about the Tower of Equus, I'm going to let Linda talk to us about that. But suffice to say, you probably know that Equus means horse. And you probably know that the Tao or the Tao means what it means, which of course is a whole other thing. So how could the Tao or the Tao, one can pronounce it either way, that which is not, that which at the moment one thinks of it is no longer, that which is everything, that which is everywhere, the Tao and the horse be connected and how on earth might that help us self-actualize? Well, in fact, it seems that people over many, many generations of humanity for at least four or 5,000 years have been seeing a connection. And Linda has been bringing it to our attention in our generation in a particularly interesting and fruitful way. So without further ado, Linda, welcome onto Live Free, Ride Free, and thank you for being here. Thank you, Rupert. It's a pleasure. So Linda, I think I did a little preamble there, but I know I didn't do you justice. Could you please tell us who you are and what do you do? I'm best known for writing five books on what humans can learn from horses. So essentially, there's, there's many different elements to this over the years. There's a mystical side, a spiritual side. There's a personal development side. There's a leadership factor. So these books are really about what horses have to teach people about becoming better humans. And it seems like I could write a whole encyclopedia of wisdom that horses keep teaching all of us that we keep seeing from different angles. And as we go deeper, we realize that they have a lot more to teach us, I believe, than we have to teach them. If you were going to preach to the unconverted, I think that those of us who are horse obsessives, and I know a lot of the people listening are, absolutely would see the connection immediately. But imagine that you had really no connection to or contact with horses at all. Why the horse? What makes the horse so special in the relationship between the, the human and, if you like, the universe and cosmos and consciousness? What's special about this relationship with this animal? It goes back thousands of years, and there's a lot of scientific evidence now to show that the animals that we quote unquote domesticated were actually domesticating us as well, that we, we co-evolved with these animals. And there are certain things that you learn from dogs and cats and birds, certain ways you're affected by them. But most dogs, cats and birds are actually predators. So when you come to a really large, powerful animal like the horse, they actually teach you how to be powerful, but in a non-predatory way. And I had to, after a while, the, word, the term non-predatory, because a lot of times people, these are large herbivores, they're vegetarians, obviously, and a lot of times they're preyed upon in nature, but they're fully capable of protecting themselves. Predators very rarely will attack 
a full grown horse, usually they're slinking around the edges looking for the young horse or the injured horse or the horse who's wandered off without paying attention. So large non-predatory animals like horses are capable of protecting themselves and even performing altruistic acts to protect other herd members. For many years, especially in the natural horsemanship field, people would talk about horses being prey animals and humans being predators. And this is where a lot of the dysfunction happens in these relationships. And that's true to a certain extent, but humans actually are omnivores. We have the eyes forward like a predator, of course, and we can strategize and we can stalk, in other words. And at the same time, we have the teeth of a vegetarian, a digestive system of an omnivore. We actually have aspects of both, predatory and non-predatory wisdom. And if we can stop over-identifying with predatory behaviors that were used in conquest, when you think about the whole world being settled by conquest and enslaving other races and enslaving other animals, you realize that there's been an overemphasis on predatory behavior in our culture throughout the world because it's all about, you know, stepping in and taking over the lands and rights of others. So we've grown up in this predatory environment, but that is not who we are. We actually have a lot more potential than that. And from the horse, we learn how to be powerful. You have to be powerful if you're around a horse. You can't be a shrinking violet. You, you can find horses that will take care of you if you're, if you're really looking, and that's, that's fine. But if you're really going to step in, as you have been a horse trainer and rider yourself, you know you have to engage a kind of power and presence, but it can't be predatory or the horse won't trust you. And so they teach us that. And for my fourth book called The Power of the Herd, and it was looking at a non-predatory approach to social intelligence, leadership, and innovation. I was researching the presence of the horse in various cultures throughout time. And one of the things I noticed was that many, like an out, actually outrageous percentage of innovative leaders across multiple cultures were also either exceptional riders or exceptional trainers. So, and a lot of people don't realize that the Buddha was an exceptional horseman. And when I really looked at his background and began to discover more about this, and I do talk about this in The Power of the Herd, it struck me that a lot of the skills that the Buddha perfected, that he later translated into meditation and mindfulness, were actually things you really need if you're going to function with horses. So I feel like in some sense, the horses were teaching him a lot of the things that eventually he translated into purely human terms. But there's also people like George Washington. In the U.S., I don't think there's any way on the planet that we would have won that war without George Washington. And George Washington was considered one of the best horse trainers in the colonies. And you can see from the way he operated with people that he had that knowledge that he learned from the horses. Winston Churchill was an exceptional equestrian. We often think of him as this this beefy guy smoking a cigar all the time. But when he was younger, he was in the cavalry and he was a great rider. I'm not sure about his horse training orientation. You know, Elizabeth I, Elizabeth II, Catherine the Great, Ronald Reagan. Even if you don't think of him as somebody that you're in sync with politically, including any of these people, actually, what you can see is that his presence and his ability to engage with and motivate large populations to follow him in a certain direction is very much like what happens when you learn how to ride and train well. And he was a very fine rider and spent a lot of time riding at his ranch when he was taking time off from the presidency. So there's just multiple examples of this. And so I've really been looking at this throughout history. One of the other elements, too, is that from a mystical viewpoint or a spiritual viewpoint, in multiple cultures throughout the world, in multiple mythic complexes and religions, the horse is considered not only a sacred gift from the gods, but the horse is also an animal that can take people from this world to the other world and bring them safely back again. So a lot of mythology involves horses taking someone to the other world. And by that, we mean 
other states of consciousness or even other dimensions and then actually bringing them back. So the horse is like a psychopop and a guide throughout history and, and around the world. So this is why I find it's so rich to bring horse wisdom into the human world because they have things to teach that we've lost sight of in our city-based culture. It's interesting what you're putting your, your finger on there. Obviously, you know, any aristocratic or military leader, since we domesticated the horse, has to a large degree been a horseman because we know that this process of conquest that you talked about happened largely on the backs of horses, which I've always found intriguing. You're, you point out that, you know, you need to have the power presence to affect a horse at the same time, if you bring the predatory aspect of that to the horse, the horse, as you say, will not trust you because he's going to think quite rightly that we might eat him. Um, and he'd be right by the way, because if we got hungry enough, we'd eat every horse in our barn. We wouldn't be happy about it, but they're right to be a little bit skeptical of us. Um, but then of course we've taken this predatory behavior to our fellow human on the back of a horse. This, we know that we've done. However, although history recounts that, well, I, I feel that you put your finger on something else there, um, which is that many of these leaders were not necessarily warlords and you started with the Buddha and it's interesting that you say that Siddhartha, as he would have been as the prince before he became what we know as the Buddha. I hadn't thought about it in that regard before, but yes, you must be absolutely right. Because if you were a prince of a North Indian, Southern Nepalese kingdom at that time, you would have de facto been a horseman, both chariots and riding. He, there's no way he could have not been with his upbringing. So you're absolutely, it's, it's intriguing that you bring that up. So here's my question. Because we have to get over, we have to be powerful without being predatory in order to be effective with horses. Do horses teach us tact? Do horses teach us diplomacy? If, if you're really going to have a horse form a real partnership with you, you have to learn that. And you have to learn that tact and diplomacy at a, at a wholly nonverbal level. So it's not just about what you're saying, it's your whole body that's radiating and then also responding thoughtfully from moment to moment to what's going on with the horse. And so in the 1990s, psychologists determined that only about 10% of human communication is verbal. 90% of the messages that we send back and forth to each other are in that nonverbal range. And a lot of times people now just rely on words. And a lot of times they're conveying something completely the opposite with their body language. When you're with a horse, you have to learn how to have an intention and a focus and have your entire body be in sync with that. So if you're conflicted, the horse is just not going to respond as well. So bringing all of that into play is essential. And really, you know, the average rider can engage serious forms of maybe even disturbing levels of tack. And I mean by this, you know, saddles and bridles and spurs and whips to motivate a horse. I'm um, just out of the horse just trying to get along in the world. But if you're going to have a real partnership with the horse, you're actually going to be transformed from the inside out and it's going to affect your entire life. Do you think that this happens because in order to really achieve that, union with a horse the horse sort of forces us to engage with our higher self absolutely and it, it it is an interesting combination with horses too because it's dual so you have to engage your higher self ultimately but it has to be fully grounded in this world they they actually teach us a grounded spirituality and the fact that they lure us into other states of consciousness or other worlds doesn't mean that we are not supposed to be here now completely embodied and focused on the moment when we're interacting with them physically. You can sit over a fence with a horse and have the horse essentially take you into an altered state of consciousness where you can kind of 
lose track of your body and where you're at and really go off into these other worlds. But if you're going to interact with a horse and you're going to go inside the fence and ride that horse or lead that horse somewhere, you have to be able to engage some level of embodied presence. So they're constantly making us exercise both sides and, and in ways that I think other people and animals rarely do as a way of interacting with. You. Yeah, embodied spirituality is what they're bringing to us. This, this brings me to another thought, which is that many people, I think, are unaware that the horse was, I think, the, the last riding animal to be domesticated, or as you say, maybe domesticated us. Um, I know that we started with the reindeer which is a relatively easy horse as long as you weigh sort of under 100 pounds, animal as long as you weigh under 100 pounds. Then I think it goes to the camel. Then I think it's the, I think the ass and the elephant are roughly concurrent. And then it's the horse. And I've often wondered about that, why the horse was so late. And then of course, well, yeah, the horse works of course in three dimensions and the horse is this really complicated animal. Um, might be someone might say, well, an elephant's really complicated, but I think an elephant's brain is a way of looking at the world is perhaps closer to ours and more intuitively ours. So what is it about the horse that we, why, why do we create this mythology around the horse and the spirituality of the horse in regard with us and not these other riding animals that we've also had these long relationships with? Because one does not find quite the same mythological engagement and quite the same spiritual engagement with these other animals as with the horse. Why do you think that is? Well, I think they were working on us creative and creatively and spiritually long before we were capable of riding them. They're just so athletic and so fast. And you have to really know what you're doing if you're going to try to ride one of them. But the interesting thing is that our relationship with the horse goes back thousands of years before we were able to ride them. Mm. And there is significant um, evidence now that they were drawing us out years before we had the technology to get on their backs and, and ride them. And the reason I say this is because when we began to understand the the cave art in France and the Lascaux cave and the another older cave that, that escapes me at the moment. Um, there's Lascaux, and I can't remember at this moment. Um, Chauvet, the Lascaux and Chauvet caves. In these caves, you see this strange evolution where uh, you have an obsession with cave art related to horses and they thought at first that people were hunting horses. But as, they, as it turns out, as they really started to look at bones left around the caves, they found out that the correlation between animals eaten and the animals painted wasn't, wasn't really related. So there's a lot of deer meat and deer bone, not deer meat anymore, obviously, but deer bones around those caves. They were eating deer, but they weren't eating so many horses, but they were obsessed with horses. And even to the point where they were, by the time you go from the Chauvet cave, um, which is much older, it's like 30,000 years old, to the Lascaux cave, which is about, I guess, 20,000 years old, you see that, that they're painting even more horses later on. And in the Chauvet cave in particular, which is the older one, they have se two alcoves, separate alcoves with horses in them, set apart from all the other animals, lions, rhinos. They, they don't really have wolves painted in these caves, by the way, interestingly enough. <laughs> and uh, so in these alcoves, horses are coming out and looking at you as if they are stepping forward and engaging eye contact with you and really looking at you. And this looks to me like the the initial, somebody was really trying to convey that initial moment where a horse reached out to us and didn't run off and then began to invite us into a relationship on the ground for thousands of years before we were able to ride them. That's and in, there's a lot of... Go ahead. Sorry yes, to interrupt you. No, it's okay. I was just blown away when I, when I began to realize that. And I, I recently revised the Tao of Equus. It's going to come out in a revised form in June. And... So I went ahead and added this right in the introduction 
to talk about how we have this perception of the horse as being an evolution that happened later, much later, but it seems like it was working on us for thousands of years and probably changed certain members of the culture who were lured out of agricult early agricultural settlements where horses might have been attracted to people learning how to plant grain and things like that and luring some people out into this nomadic lifestyle hmm. that eventually caused people to form these interspecies societies and it, I find the reindeer people I talked about the reindeer people in the Dow of Equus because I found them very interesting in that some of the reports, anthropological reports, state that these people consider themselves half human, half reindeer. Yeah. And there are certain horse cultures where they consider themselves half human, half horse. So a lot of these cultures you find, they're, they truly were engaged in an equal partnership that was mutually transformational. It's interesting. There's a couple of things which spring to mind here. You talk about an animal species domesticating the human. And I'm, I'm, as I'm sure you're aware of, and some of our listeners may be aware of, there is a fairly well-founded theory that civilization as we know it, i.e. agriculture and industry that comes out of agriculture, is based upon us being domesticated by a certain type of grass that we call wheat. And that this happened Oh, between 20 and 15,000 years ago, somewhere in what's now Kurdistan, you know, in those upper plateaus at the, uh, at the source of the, the Euphrates. And um, that this particular type of hardy grass developed a relationship with us as much as a relationship with them. What I haven't considered until now, and this is intriguing to me, is, of course, what would have been eating that grass? if not herds of wild horses. And we know that those areas of Eastern Anatolia and the Southern Caucasus going up around to the north of the Black Sea and so on, this is sort of the cradle of where we find the earliest horse civilizations. Makes sense. So did the, did the grass domesticate us and then the main species uh, subsisting upon that grass then take that domestication further. And then another question comes to mind from that, which is it's often assumed that herding, herding of herbivores predates um, farming as a sort of interim period between straight up hunting and gathering and um, planting of crops. But what you're suggesting there is a potential other way around which is that perhaps we began to be domesticated seasonally by some of these plants, then some of the animals coming in and being attracted to those made us think, hmm, perhaps we could herd these. Um, what do you think about that as a, as a motif, really? We don't have to say it's a belief because we don't have to believe one way or the other, but these things are interesting concepts, to motifs for the brain. What, 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 what do you feel, feel and think about that? There are people who say that outright. There are scientists who say that outright. So it's, it's what I call the oasis theory is that humans learned how to plant these grasses on purpose and take care of them. They had to guard them, you know, because there are other animals coming in to eat them. And, and they have to be more settled in order to stick around to guard these plants as they're starting to grow. And as they're sitting there guarding the grasses that are growing the wheat, then animals are coming up and they're chasing them off, but they're starting to observe their behavior. And sometimes they're chasing them down and eating them. And then you have some people just sitting out guarding these, this, these wheat fields and they start to notice the horses and, and become more intrigued by them. And having less of a, a hunter mentality and more of a naturalist mentality if you're guarding the wheat like that. And so they're observing the horse behavior. They're, they're seeing young horses. They're starting to reach out to them. They, the horses are getting used to their presence. And eventually maybe somebody actually holds out a hand of grain to feed one of the younger horses that they've 
they're enamored with. And then through that interaction, eventually the horses would have lured some of those people, some of those more adventurous people into this nomadic lifestyle. So there are actually scientific theories that suggest that we had early agriculture and we started to move towards settled lifestyles, at least semi-settled, to take care of these agricultural situations. And then some people were lured into a nomadic lifestyle with the animals that were attracted to those settings so that there's agriculture and then there's two branches. There's a, there's a kind of agriculture that headed toward city-based lifestyles, and then there's a kind of agriculture that headed toward nomadic pastoral lifestyles, and they branched off from there. Yeah, interesting. And your your point about um, animals domesticating us, I have actually I have actually witnessed and experienced this twice. Um, those listeners who know my the pre autism background, I I was a human rights activist and journalist in the Kalahari area of Southern Africa for a long time. My family is all Southern African, so I lived with. Khoisan hunter-gatherers because we were working on their land claim issues to get them legal title to their ancestral lands in South Africa and Botswana for many years. And so I had a couple of experiences there where, for example, um, we were making camp in an area that had almost no human footprint at all. And within about 10 days, the jackals of that area, the black back jackals, which would be quite quickly beginning to circle our camp because they could smell the goodies, were at the point where they would come and accept meat from the hand, I'd say within 10 days. And, but all of the initial overtures in terms of the charming, almost puppy-like behavior and invitations, the sort of getting down with the front legs and then looking up and cocking the ears and cocking the head to the side, you know, sort of what we think of as invitation, puppy like invitations to play from a dog, they were exhibiting that towards us. Um, and um, so did, did we domesticate them or did they domesticate us? Then I had a similar experience with birds of prey, um, also in Africa and Zimbabwe, and where my father's from, where we were canoeing down the banks of the Zambezi for a sort of extended time. Um, I did it once. And then I sort of went back and did it again a couple of times. And what happened was that the guides had learned that, or rather the kites, bird of prey is called a kite, had learned that where the camps generally were along the river, if they circled, there'd be stuff. And the guides soon learned that they could throw bits of meat up into the air and the kites would swoop in and grab it. And then the kites began to swoop in this playful way to, if you like, to instigate the very very intelligent birds the guides into doing this who domesticated who um i would have said until recently well we domesticated them we we were in this place we as humans and then we did this they they were lured by our you know goodies and then we did behaviors that domesticated them but perhaps that's not the case um if that's not the case what do you think would have motivated and prompted the horse to come and engage with an upright ape with the eyes in front, which clearly is a predator as well as an omnivore. We absolutely do hunt. I've, you know, hunted with the Bushmen uh, and they, for example, they will hunt zebra. So they would, we would have hunted equines, you know, up here in the Northern hemisphere. So given that we did probably hunt them, what do you feel made them reach out to us? Why would they reach out to us, given that we're a dangerous lot? Well, I think they were reaching out to people who were less dangerous in the beginning. Mm. So you have people who have more of a hunter mentality, but, you know, as you know, in a lot of these cultures, they have, hunters have tremendous respect yeah. for the prey. They're not, they're not torturing them. They're not hunting them to virtual extinction there is a there is a symbiotic relationship and that's that is even related to the prayers that they say before they hunt mm. after they've killed an animal before they eat an animal they're thanking this animal there is this feeling of a mutual support system and and horses are being used are used to being hunted by 
all kinds of animals. And Mm -hmm. when you see pictures now on YouTube or videos on YouTube in Africa, you see that a lot of times these large herbivores, whether they're zebras or wildebeest, will live in the midst of predators. And there will be predators milling around in the vicinity and they don't automatically run. So they have some herd members acting as sentinels and they can read the behavior of a predator when it's on the prowl and a predator when it's just relaxing or wandering through the field on their way to a good nap somewhere else. And so horses and other animals that are herbivores have thousands of years of living among predators and being able to tell when they're in that hunting mode and when they're not. That's a very good point. Also, yeah. No. Yeah. And so when people say, oh, you know, the the horse thinks you're a predator when you get on his back to ride. No, he doesn't because he can tell that you're not acting like a predator at that moment. Mm. And if you are acting in a hyper dominant predatory manner, that horse is less likely to let you on their back. So that's one aspect of it. The other thing I think is that um, they called us out, you know, that, that there is a horse consciousness that reached out to us just like those jackals reached out to you or those they sensing also because we're we're planting grain that's that's getting better and better um, we're taking them to pastures and we're guarding them we're acting as guardians of them from other predators and so there's this way in which you you create this mutual support system with another species that appreciates that i mean there's the horse is now proliferated around the world because of their association with humans. Mm. Um, they, you know, so there were there were advantages to the relationship from the beginning. And yeah, these it, are these are these are valid uh, points. Yeah, I was I'm just minded. I was in Namibia earlier this year, and you're dead right. We were watching a pride of lion who were deciding whether or not to engage with a very large herd of zebra who were deciding whether or not they should be worried about this. And what was interesting was that it was th- the, the pride was actually three grown lionesses who were the hunters and some half grown cubs who obviously needed, you know, to learn the trade. And so they would stalk a bit and try a little rush here and there. And you could see that the, the you could see the zebra sort of looking at them and go, meh, yeah, yeah, meh. I will move off a little bit, but we can tell you're not really a threat. And, but they were keeping an eye on where the three lionesses were. And when they moved, the herd would shift accordingly. But for sure, no rush was made in the, in the time that we were watching them. Um, and if that is most of the time, I guess if you're a human predator or a, or a, or a feline predator or a canine predator, every time you try to make a kill, you're expending energy. Most hunts will not be successful. How many times do you want to expend that energy uh, before you run out of energy? The animal you're hunting is always faster than you, wilier than you. So I can see, yes, from what you say that why would they engage with us when we're tricky predators? Because, well, we don't always behave that way. Absolutely. And do you, but do you feel, because a lot of people um, would contend that horses do not really think rationally, that they represent the more irrational, emotionally based intelligence, that they're not the strategic communicators that perhaps we or wolves or hyenas or other pack-based predatory things are, you know, we have language, we use that for, to strategize. Do you feel that consciously horses in this early phase of contact with humans were able to take it beyond the, okay, they're not behaving too aggressively and they've got some grass that we like. Do you think that there was something else going on, a curiosity? Absolutely. Horses are incredibly curious and they're very powerful and fast. And so they can afford to entertain curiosity in a different way than you might see a rabbit be curious about something because, you know, the rabbit's not powerful and capable of, you know, really 
I mean, you see rabbits are constantly looking around. It's like, is it safe to be out here in the open? Because they and they have to run off immediately, whereas a horse has more of a presence. And if they're in a group of empowered horses together, they know they can run off a lot of predators, especially the less experienced ones, and especially when they draw on the power of a fully empowered herd. So their curiosity is something that was captured in those early cave paintings. When you see the horse coming out of the alcove, looking very curiously and invitingly, the painter, the way he's portraying that. So yeah, because they're powerful and fast, they can afford to be curious. And they are. They, we don't know how their consciousness works exactly, but we see through their behavior how adaptable they are and how easily they will override their basic survival instincts when they are, when they feel connected to others. And so, I mean, if, if a horse was purely an instinctual animal, there's no way you would get such an animal to go onto a trailer. Mm-hmm. They don't go into small enclosed spaces. If, if a horse were a purely instinctual animal, there's no way they would ride into war, mm-hmm. into the smell of blood, into the screams of horses and humans. You know, so they, when they have a connection to certain humans, they will go into war. And one of the things that I also illustrated in The Power of the Herd, for instance, is that George Washington had this ability to pick exceptional horses who were exceptionally brave. So he didn't see them as bundles of instincts. He saw them as individuals. And he would choose horses to go into war who had a natural presence and bravery. And there's one description of a bunch of soldiers stuck on a bridge with with the enemy coming toward them. And one of the guys descri- who was one of the soldiers describes how they were like really, really scared at that moment, as you would be. And he actually looked up and saw that George Washington and his horse were right next to him and that the horse was just had this presence of being really centered in the midst of this threat and that he actually leaned against the horse and borrowed the horse's courage. So we have to stop thinking of horses as bundles of instincts and realize there are individuals, yes, who are going to be shy and run off. There are individuals who don't want to accept a rider. We know that. There are individuals who love to be ridden. There are individuals who love to go out on trail rides. You know, there there are individuals who will reach out to children who are in states of distress that normally would cause a horse's nervous system to go into a flight or fight mode. That was so clear with Rowan and Betsy, the horse that reached out to him Mm. when he was in a state of real turmoil. With horses, they're they're highly empathic. So if, if somebody's in a state of turmoil at that level, a lot of horses would simply spook and run off. But some horses have the capacity to step in and help to co-regulate that person. Mm. So these are natural healing horses. Not all horses are going to be that way. So I think when we look at them as individuals, we get to see certain talents and orientations. And we don't know how conscious they are of this. But a lot, I see a lot of people act in different kinds of ways, brave or caring, who are not conscious of what they're doing at that moment. They're the kind of dream of of uh, an orientation or a talent that lures you into places where you gain more and more confidence and you're not even conscious of how you got there. Yes. And no, I, 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 I think that, you know, th- there's this, there's this cliche and I call cliches, of course, it's based in a truth, which is that, you know, the horse is your mirror. If you go grumpy to the horse, you might get a bit of a grumpy response. If you're afraid, he might be afraid and so on. But, uh, but of course I feel it goes beyond that I, and, and this idea with the higher self and curiosity i think what one sees often with horses is is that really defines the, their species as herbivores maybe even more than others when you observe them together is this is playfulness this this seeking out of of play and entertainment and when i'm got my horse trainer hat on what I'm often saying to people is don't be a horse trainer, be a horse entertainer. 
be interesting to the horse, be, <laughs> be worth interacting with, you know, uh, so that when the horse sees you coming, they think, oh, you know, th th this might be good crack, you know, today. What's he got? You know, what's shaking? Rather than, oh, shit, here comes that, you know, person that makes me just endlessly do the same thing and is always a bit, you know, frustrated with me for not quite understanding what's in their brain. Um, I wonder if it's this aspect, this playful aspect of the horse that has the potential to bring out, if you like, this higher self because in us, because when horses are playful together, as we know, they're quite rough and they, you know, when horses are really playing together, a weak little monkey like us is, it's not great to be in the way of that. There's a reason why we call rough play horse play. Um, yet we can engage with them. And as you say, that they, they will modify their behavior like Betsy did with my son, for example, you know, in, in a way which I thought I knew horses quite well until I observed that. And then I realized, oh gosh, I really don't know horses as well as I thought I did. In fact, I need to revise everything I know. This is really interesting. This is a good thing. Um, which brings me to my next question. And I think, welcome. I mean, I just one little point here yeah. is that, you know, when they, when people, People say they're not conscious or they don't have logical capacity or strategic thinking or whatever. I mean, I have several horses that know how to open gates. Yeah. So, I mean, I have to put one on them, then get out, and they'll let everybody else loose. And I never taught them how to open these gates. And I even have a horse that... Um, you just provided them with rather, rather interesting like, puzzles for them, which is very nice of you. <laughs> right, right. Well, I mean, I, I, I have some temporary corral panels that I set up and I've, you know, sort of put a chain around the gate. And then I've had horses figure out how to loosen the pins, pull up and loosen the pins and get out. You know, so well, you have to just, you have to realize they're strategizing. They can totally run mazes on my property mm -hmm. because I have all kinds of different um, sections of corrals that are, if I open them up, they know how to get from one to the other. They know exactly what to do. So these are things they learned on their own. They figured it out for themselves. So there is logical, strategic thinking in horses. We're, it's just that when they're out in the, you know, like zebras in the Kalahari or something like that, they, they don't have a need for that kind of strategic intelligence. They're paying attention to other things. Is it this? This is the question. I'm, I'm, or is it this playfulness and this curiosity? bring that we something in us responds to that right that what to us is play and curiosity if not joy right and so it seems to me is is it do you think that that's perhaps the difference between our symbolic relationship with horses and the other animals which we ride like Reindeers, donkeys, camels, elephants, water buffalo, and others. Do you think it's this aspect of playfulness and inquisitive curiosity that brings up this special sort of meta love that we seem to have for this animal across cultures? You know, one finds horse cultures in every continent except Antarctica. Um, is, is that what it is? And is that why horses have this ability to sort of heal the human heart? What, 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 to bring us back to joy? What, what, what are your thoughts about that? Horses experience a full range of emotions and they move through them very quickly. They're very emotionally agile animals. So if they're angry at a stallion that's coming in too close, you know, the mare will sort of you know, pin her ears and then crescendo. If the stallion isn't paying attention, she'll then, you know, squeal and turn around and fight. And then if he doesn't back off, then she'll turn around and mule kick the guy. And then, you know, maybe 10 minutes later, you see them hanging out together under their favorite tree. So that's emotional agility to move from anger, which is about setting boundaries, and then move to a sense of peacefulness and connection. And they experience, they definitely experience sadness and grief. I've seen it a lot. A lot of people don't realize that, but I, I have talked about it quite a bit in my books. 
they experience incredible joy and peacefulness and contentment. And yet they move through all of those emotions very efficiently and go back to grazing, as I like to say. Um, Whereas humans hang on to certain emotional states and retell the story over and over and over again. So this is one of the things that we learn from horses when we begin to see them as teachers, is how to be more emotionally agile and how to feel an emotion in its purest form and get the message behind it, change something in response to that message, and then let it go and go back to grazing. So there's an emotional intelligence in horses that we can learn from that we've lost sight of in our city-based cultures and our focus on language and telling stories over and over and over again, rather than being in the present. In the present, it's not that we don't want to tell stories or shouldn't tell stories. We should, but to fixate on them at the expense of being present in life is part of our sort of human psychology that's gotten out of control over time with our focus on words. But horses engage in incredible moments of joy and contentment and peacefulness. I talk about standing among a group of horses huddled together on pasture about how I'm often privy to a secret bliss, really. Privy to a secret Sometimes bliss. Sometimes they're dozing. Write that down. Please go ahead. <laughs> privy to a secret bliss. I love that. So, Sometimes they are dozing, but sometimes they're not. Yeah. They only seem to be dozing. Actually, in this collective subsonic reverie so deep that I feel like it vibrates through the bonds and, and expands the heart, leaving the ears untouched. So that you're, you're, when you're with horses and you really slow down and stop being so fixated on your human agenda and just enter into their world, you begin to expand into areas of peace and joy and connection that sometimes people have never experienced with a member of their own species. So it's, it's very profound. And I think this is part of the reason why horses, being with horses is so healing. Well put. Um, it's interesting that almost all of the metaphors that we use around horses are always superlatives or positive things. If you compare a situation or somebody or something to something equine, that person's a real stallion. That person's a real stud that, uh, you know, um, that person uh, has got, a, you know, I suppose you say kick like a mule, but it's really a type of horse. That person, gosh, th there are so many, I think, equine um, references in our culture. We know that Shakespeare was a great horseman and falconer, and he, he's peppered his plays with it, all the, you know, hold your horses, hold hard, you know, um, but that generally you don't use a metaphor of a horse to say someone is rubbish <laughs> you you usually use a metaphor of a horse as a as a as an emotional strength and others positive right one of the things which you pointed out about this emotional agility i wrote that down to i like that are you familiar with gulliver's travels you know the the, the 18th century english novel um that was made into a uh, disney made a famous film about you know you've got gulliver who's the lilliputians the little people they tie him down so that's that's one of the he goes to the island of Lilliput. He goes to the island of Brobdignag, where he encounters giants. But he also goes, and this was not in the film, he goes to the island of the Hui Hinnoms. And the Hui Hinnoms are horses, but they're horses that speak English and live in a sort of a, 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 a life that reflects 18th century England. And there's this, he has great admiration for them because they seem to have exactly, as you just pointed out, a sort of emotional agility and perspective where he's taking tea with a very elegant mare, a very elegant sorrel mare who's serving him tea in her house. And it comes up in the course of the conversation that her husband has recently died. And Gulliver's, oh, I'm terribly sorry to hear that, my lady. And, you know, I, I, my condolences. And, and she says, oh, no, why, why would you say that? He, he led a very, very good life. We had a, an absolutely lovely time together. He's been dead about a day and a half. And I remember him well, and my present is good. Do horses bring us into the present moment? They do, absolutely. But I've also seen horses engage in extensive grief. So that, I mean, we, we would say that that's incredibly emotionally agile of this 
you know, Lady Mare in that book. I need to go and read that because I've never, I never knew that part of the book. I need to find that. So she's showing extreme emotional agility. Yes, she lived a good life, you know, all of that. And, and it doesn't seem like she's grieving, but in reality, horses do grieve because part of it is because our nervous systems sync up. And we know that from the polyvagal theory, for instance, of Stephen Porges. We know that we are, as mammals, and that includes horses, designed to connect with each other, to experience safety through connection, and that, that it's really impossible or difficult for us to heal or um, even evolve as a lone wolf. I mean, even wolves don't really engage in lone wolf behavior. So mammals are, are designed to socially engage and to use their nervous systems to co-regulate each other so that when one is distressed, others will reach out and calm that horse and vice versa. And a lot of people didn't understand that this is actually a, a feature of the nervous system of mammals until recently when Dr. Porges came out with this theory, and it explains a lot. So one of the things that happens with horses when they are allowed to form close, lifelong partnerships is their nervous systems sync up and affect each other. And so when one of these horses dies, the other horse really feels like their nervous system is missing something huge, if you just want to put it in scientific terms. So I've had horses, and I don't, I have several horses who I've raised. I've had multiple generations of a certain herd of horses that they were never separated from their parents. They were weaned, and then they were put back in with their parents and brothers and sisters and cousins and uncles. and. When one of those parents dies, the horse that's closest to that parent will actually shut down and become incredibly depressed because there was, I can see in certain instances where they were in such sync, co-regulating each other for years and years and years, that then when that physical presence is no longer there, there's something huge missing. There's like a part of them dies with the other being that dies. And that's the same for spouses or parents and human children. So... Why is, yeah, it they, that, why is it that horses bring us into the present moment? There's a really good quote from the Tower of Equus where you, you talk about when, you're, when you mount a horse, you must put the past where it belongs. You must be in the present and you must have your mind on the immediate sort of optimistic future. Um, why is it that horses put us into the present? Why do we need to be in the present moment with horses? And why is it that we do seem to go into that state of unawareness of anything else when we're with a horse what, what what what's doing that in us part of it is because they're so big you have to pay attention you have to be present if you're going to be around them or you'll get knocked around and stepped on and if if you're really present and i know you know this because you are a fine rider you can feel a horse I don't, I don't know whether I should say thinking of spooking or you can feel a horse's intention to spook in your body before they can get their thousand pound body to do that. And if, so if you're really present, you can move, move with a sudden sideways leap because you're, you're, there's a part of you that's already sensed it's about to happen. And you can't do that if you're not fully present. You know, that's how you topple off and, and get dragged or left in the dust. So I think when you're with horses and you're really doing serious things with them, like riding or training young horses or rehabilitating abused horses, the more present you are, the more you can actually feel what's about to happen and do something to shift it before it gets out of control. Yeah. That's I the mean, advantage of being present. Yeah, I could see. Yeah. I, I, th I think that the presence of imminent danger is exactly as you describe, which one is whether one's next to or on top of a horse. It's just there. As you say, it's a thousand pound animal that can respond violently to small things. Um, and when one's on it, you know, one of the things I often think is so interesting about riding is how one has to go completely against nature and intuition, you know, that the horse was not designed really to carry monkeys yet. And there we are sitting on one and with our top heavy, uh, you know, heavy head and shoulders, we're not really designed to sit on a moving barrel, yet we sort of evolved to be able to do that if we put enough work into it. And then we want to, as, you know, sight apes, 
solve our problems with our eyes and our hands, which of course might work against us with horses if we grab on tight. And then of course, we want to go into a bit of a, of a crouch if we feel afraid, which naturally we're going to on the back of a horse. Um, but because if we do that, we're going to tilt forward and go out the front door, let alone transmit our fear to, to the, to the animal yet. And of course, it doesn't really make an awful lot of sense for a horse to let us come near. You know, every herbivore has to be, if you like, trained from the wild as a baby to accept the presence of humans. And yet, miraculously, if we put enough work into it together, it seems to happen. Um, what I'm wondering is, is well, you, go, you go, go ahead with this. Yeah. What, what, what do you think about, about that? Well, here's the thing. We have to stop thinking of ourselves as apes that just showed up out of the blue among herds of horses. This is not true. We're talking about at least, I, I think it's about 6,000 years of evidence of actually riding horses, but longer evidence, as I say, with the cave paintings of people being inspired by them and intrigued by them and engaged. And through those interactions, we have evolved. So we're not purely... Oh, I would agree you know, with you there, but, the back but, but nonetheless, one has the, the horse when it's a very young horse, even ones that one has bred oneself, their first reaction to a human is, you know, and they might come across for a bit of a sniff, but they kind of want to get behind their mum, you know, and even the mum who is used to us is like, okay, but this is my baby, you know, be cool. And then, of course, when we climb up on horses, when we're learning to ride, we're entering a completely unknown three-dimensional space where we have to basically create a body map with an animal that we may or may not really understand who has to create a body map with us. And we have to sync our nervous systems up. And then we have to learn all this technical stuff. And it's jolly difficult, which is why relatively few people do it. Otherwise, everyone would be doing it, right? But nonetheless, it happens. Um, I always feel that there's some aspect of the miraculous with that. I, I agree with you that we've had thousands of years of interaction with these animals, but it's, it seems that every single time we're still starting from scratch. I mean, every time I start with a new horse that comes to me for training, I'm starting from scratch. Every time I'm writing a new book, I'm starting from scratch. Just because I wrote a, a book, you know, before doesn't mean that when I sit in front of that blank page. Well, I know I'm, that one. You know that one? Yeah, you know that one. And I'm sure a lot of Oh, my God. But, Every time I think it's going to be easy and it's absolutely not, it never no, gets easier. <laughs> no, no. You, you sort of kid yourself it's going to be so that you begin and then you're like, oh shit, why did I, why did I let myself in for this again? Um, absolutely. But, but, oh, here we go. Another five years. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the, yeah, there's this miraculous thing where you, yeah, you look up and, and then boom, there's this book and, oh, I've just added another one by the, in, to the coven of, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, library. And um, then you have called immediate amnesia because you're beginning the new one. Um, writing sometimes brings us into the present moment, but I don't think it brings, you know, one sometimes has to find one's way into the present moment with the pursuit of the human arts, uh, because it's one is contending with one's own nervous system and brain only. I think there's this thing, do you not agree of contending and finding relationship with a whole other nervous system and brain that is not our own. It's not a dance partner that's human. It's not a lover that's human. It's not a, someone that we can stop and say, hold on, hold on. Can we just rewind there? What did you mean by that? Or could you touch me differently? Or you stepped on my toe or, or whatever. We have to evolve this other language, don't we? Um, what do you feel about the miraculous in the human horse relationship, which for me is that immediate room straight into the present moment, whether you want to or not, you're just there. You don't even have to try. To me, that is miraculous. Um, and it, it seems that it, mythologically, you know, we, we're always equi equating horses to the miraculous. You, you mentioned Pegasus in the Tower of Equus, you know, very eloquently. The, what is the winged horse, if not an expression of miracle, you know? What is your feeling about the miraculous with horses and humans? Horses have a connection with this world here and now, where I also believe horses have a connection to a much wider view of consciousness, mm. whether that's spirit, whether that's God, whether it's the great mystery, whatever you want to call it. 
and you know a, a lot of a lot of people who do trans trans possession let's say in certain cultures they call themselves horses mm. when they do that and the idea is that the spirit's coming in and actually riding you mm. and horses just seem to have a capacity for that with human riders as well as actual spirit. So I've seen horses act in ways that are not related to how their personality is in normal life. And it seems like they're being they're being ridden or possessed for a moment, you might say, or opening themselves up to an influence of a larger spiritual nature. I've seen them take on the personality traits of people people who have passed in the presence of um people who are grieving, let's say. Now, that's miraculous for sure. And so I think this ability to, to be very powerful and present, but also being, this may be why horses are agreed to be ridden, actually, is that they are capable of also expanding into allowing another form of intelligence to come in and actually run things for a while. Um, so that... By eventually having a human being able to ride, maybe that was just a small physical manifestation in their minds of the idea of being ridden by larger spiritual forces. There's also a group intelligence with horses that I encountered in the Tao of Equus, where I talk about accessing the horse ancestors. Um, and, you know, there's just ways in which they are open to what's happening in the moment in this physical world, but they're also equally open, it seems, in the moment to spiritual forces. And it's hard to be around them for years and years and years where you see the miraculous things that they do with people at times that's out of character for the individual horse at the time without actually realizing, oh my God, there's something else going on here. There are other forms of intelligence. There, there are things that we can allow in too. Because when you're writing a book, you're, you're accessing another form of intelligence it's it's in this case when you're writing it's a, it's it's a slightly dissociative pres uh, uh, presence because actually I had a person study this and talk about discordant dissociation where it's survival dissociation where you dissociate because you're going into flight or fight mode and you're trying to just survive whereas there's also concordant dissociation which is a form of dissociation that artists engage and writers. So that, you know how you, when you get into this state, you lose all contact with what's going on. And four or five hours later, you realize you're starving and you didn't even realize it was five hours that went by. And during that time, you almost feel like you're downloading something. You know, sometimes you're staring at the blank page and you're like, when, when can I get this thing to, to take over here? Right. Yeah. Um, and then when it takes over, it's, there's also a feeling of ecstasy associated with it. Mm. And studies of, of people who go into creative states and they show that, yes, certain endorphins are released in states of creativity that reward you for going into those states. Mm -hmm. So there's an interesting, interesting aspects of horses that let us in on certain mysteries of the universe that we wouldn't be noticing otherwise. And like you were saying earlier, just to ride a horse, you have to do all kinds of things that are counter instinctual. So that when a horse spooks, rather than roll over into a fetal position and grab on, because that causes the horse to go faster, you have to sit up and you have to start breathing and you have to sink into the saddle in order to have any hope of staying on the horse. So horses are teaching people and people are teaching horses all the time to do things that are counter instinctual so that we can begin to use our nervous systems for higher purposes. Beautifully put, um, to be able to do things that are counter instinctual, well, those are jolly useful skills. If one's going to be alive and thrive on planet earth in whatever sphere, I guess, I feel that there's some aspect of dream in our relationship with horses. You know, um, as you say, in the shamanic, for example, when I was in Mongolia with the shamans there, they talk as do the shamans in Tibet of the wind horse, you know, everybody has a wind horse, which is sort of your luck, your mojo, your, but you can also ride the wind horse. It can be an actual thing to an altered state of consciousness. If you're a trained shaman to get, um, uh, instructions from the spirit world or the ancestral world, 
the word in Mongolian for the wild horse, what we would call the Pravalsky horses, the takin, which means um, revered one, a venerable one, honored one. Um, this idea of, of, of this repository of power. Um, and these are not the horses they ride. These are the horses that exist outside of, of their domestication. Um, we have this idea of horses carrying us. You know, you've talked about this extensively between worlds as well as two new worlds. You know, we, the conquistadors went on the back of the horse through the Americas, but the idea also of riding the wind horse, the dream horse. At some point you were dreaming about horses. I realized that we're, you know, about an hour in. I have been so into nerding out on all this that I've forgotten to ask you anything about how you got here to live free and ride free. When was there a little girl version of yourself dreaming about this relationship with horses? And how did you come to this point now where this is your life, this is your work? Talk us through the biography, please. I was always enamored with horses. And I was one of these kids that would just bang for a horse every year. And my parents were afraid of them. We actually had enough land to have horses, but they were afraid of horses. And so they, you know, I would have to sneak off actually, because they wouldn't even let me take lessons. I would have to sneak off and go through the woods. And I found this old horse trader's farm and I could come up to the back of his property and he would have this transient herd because he was a horse trainer. And some of them were ex race horses. Some of them were ex riding horses. Some of them were really old that you knew that this was their last stop on the way to the, you know, the, the slaughterhouse or something like that. And some of them were very, very dangerous. And some of them were very calm and sweet. And I didn't have bridles or halters or a riding instructor. I would just go back there and spend hours and hours and hours. I even built a little fort right next to the, the pasture where the horses were. And I would just sit out there for hours and I would lure certain horses over to the fence if they were amenable. And I would get on them and I would just kind of ride around bareback. And I, of course, I had no real control. I was just a little kid, but the horse would let me on its back and carry me around certain ones. And you could tell the difference between the ones who were amenable and engaged and the ones who were frantic and dangerous. And so, I would just learn over time how to assess. Um, and if I hadn't have learned to assess, I probably would just be, you know, I would be dead. <laughs> I would have died with one of these racehorses running over me or something. So um, so that was a, a way of developing this expanded nonverbal awareness of horses. And then I would hire myself out at the fair to people just to groom horses. And so... And it was, I mean, it was such an extreme interest, but at the same time, I was, I was also a musician. Um, and what I, sort of I play the, the viola. You play I the play the violin, viola. I, I play the viola. I, I was actually a music major. I got a full scholarship to be a viola major in college. And so I played in a lot of symphonies and chamber music groups. But as you're growing up and you're learning to play an instrument like this, and you're playing in lots of chamber groups, since I was... 10 years old. And then in, in high school, we had orchestra five days a week and I was in chamber music groups as well. So I'm spending hours and hours in, in this place with the horses that I was sneaking off to see and with the music in this place of nonverbal awareness, expanded nonverbal awareness and engagement with others in a nonverbal setting. And you have to be really present also as a musician you learn how to, to actually be in symphonies where you're portraying strong emotions at times. And, you know, when you have a brass section behind you and you're, they're projecting out to a full audience, that is moving, that, that sound of those brass instruments behind you is actually rattling your entire nervous system. And in the middle of that, you have to stay present with what you're supposed to play. But you have to be emotive enough. So if you're like riding the wings of the angels into ecstasy and you're not present with what's happening at the same time, you know, the bow flies out of your hand and it hits the conductor and he falls off and the whole thing comes to a crashing halt. So with music also, you learn how to be present in the midst of wild, strong, nervous system, invigorating things that are happening. So I think those two things together... And then when I started to, to write, I was also a music journalist. So I was learning how to, I was learning how to write about things that were hard to put into words. So by the time I was 
got my first horse when I was in Tucson working as a classical radio announcer and a jazz radio announcer and a music journalist, I, I, I noticed how easy it was for people in Tucson to have horses. You don't have to have barns. You don't have to worry about ice and snow and mud here. You can just have a nice shade cover for the horses in your backyard and have a couple of horses. It's not a big deal. So I and finally in my 30s, I said, you know what? I'm getting a horse because actually I wanted to get a horse to get as far away from people on a regular basis because people were driving me insane. Because I had, you know, most people suppress emotion. The average person's taught to suppress emotion and wear a mask of whatever's socially acceptable. Musicians are taught to express emotion and they're rewarded handsomely for it in some cases. But both of these suppression and expression exploits are two sides of the same dysfunctional coin. And so when I got my first horse, I was just like, these musicians are driving me crazy. These regular people are driving me crazy. I just have to get out of here. And you know what? I have enough money. Finally, I'm getting a horse. And so I got my first horse to get away from people. But what I noticed was that the horse was showing me a different form of emotional intelligence. So people who express emotion never get the message behind it and change something response and go back to grazing. They just express and express and express. And people who suppress emotion never get past that first step either. You know, so when I noticed horses having this four point method of emotional agility, it was like they brought me back into the capacity to engage with people in a more productive way. So the four step method was, I could see it. It took me about five years to put this into words. But horses feel the emotion in its purest form. Then they get the message behind the emotion. Then they change something in response to the message. And then they let it go and they go back to grazing. Whereas most people don't get past step one. Expressors feel the emotion, but they never get the message and change something in response. There's all kinds of musicians we see who get rewarded for engaging in ill-fated relationships so they can write the next hit song about you know, she done me wrong or something like that. Or in rap music, they'll put themselves, especially in the early rap music, they would put themselves into situations that would drum up large amounts of rage. And, and so then they wouldn't really get the message behind that either. They're just rage, 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 or sadness, sadness, or crying in your beer country music. And putting a tear so in your beer. You're going to live yeah. a life. Yeah. Pardon? Putting a tear in your beer. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah, putting a tear in your beer. So, um, so when I was with horses, I'm like, oh, they have the answer. You know, the suppressors don't even get to step one. They do everything they can to not feel an emotion. The expressors feel an emotion, but they never get to the other steps. And then I noticed horses were doing this very intelligent thing, and it changed my life. So talk talk us through it step by step. Exactly. Step one, step two, step three, step four. And at what point you, you really first observed this? One of the things I first observed, and this seemed magical, it seemed miraculous, was that when I would go out to the barn, people would say they were fine, you know, or, or act like everything was okay or act really macho about something or another. Um, but I could actually tell what emotional state they were in by the way their horse was acting. It didn't, mm-hmm. didn't take me very long to start noticing that pattern. So, you know, horses will act, can sense, and then act out sometimes the exact emotion somebody's hiding. So you were and, keeping your horse, your first horse at a barn where other people were keeping their horses and you got to observe this interaction. Yes. And for a while, I was like, wow, that is fascinating. How is that even possible? And I mean, now there are ways that I can explain it, and which is why I've written a number of books. And I do explain it more in my video courses where I really go through what is, what is how are horses doing this and what are they teaching us and how are humans doing it too? We're just not conscious of it. Is that emotions are contagious, basically. And when you suppress an emotion, Actually, it causes your blood pressure to rise and it causes the blood pressure of everyone interacting with you to rise also. That's a study in social intelligence by Daniel Goleman. And so horses just as empaths 
and being more fully present than we are, have the capacity to sense the emotion underneath the mask or facade. And they will act it out or just walk away from it. And when a person becomes congruent, when the person actually acknowledges the hidden emotion, the horse will often come back over and engage, even if you haven't done anything to solve the emotion. Because um, like one of, one of the most powerful things I ever saw was a woman who had been raped, who was coming out to do some work, um, to be, feel more empowered and step back into life. And she went in with this horse named Sam and she, um, she started crying and the horse just went and flipped his mane and walked away from her. And she was like, you could imagine what she felt, you know, she's being rejected by the horse now. And she's like, well, everybody's just telling me I should just get over this. And everybody's, you know, um, they're just tired of all of my tears. And, and I said, no, no, I don't think that's what's going on. I think there's an emotion underneath the tears that you're not acknowledging. Because this horse, act, what do you think that horse was, was conveying? What emotion do you think that horse was conveying as he like tossed his head and sputtered, and sort of marched off? And she goes, well, he looked kind of angry. I said, yeah. And I said, so is there any anger underneath the tears? And she realized that, yes, I mean, anger really is an emotion that's about, that rises when somebody's overstepped a boundary with you. And it's the emotion, the intensity of anger is, is supposed to let you set a boundary if you use it properly. And so that's one of the ultimate boundary violations is to be raped. So yeah, she had sadness and her life had been turned upside down, but underneath was this absolute outrage at her entire life being turned upside down. So she started to access this anger and she started pounding on the fence post and talking about this, you know, and really starting to, to show the true body language associated with anger. And that horse turned around and came back over and wrapped his head around her as she pounded on the fence post. So it was like the horse didn't, was less upset about whatever she was feeling than the horse was more aggravated by the fact that she was hiding a strong emotion. And when she accessed the strong emotion, as long as she wasn't directing it at the horse, the horse was like, I can be here with you in that, you know? And so when people are crying sin sincere tears of sadness or grief, horses will often come over and comfort them. But also, if there's sincere anger that's legitimate, that's being accessed, I've seen horses walk over and be present with a person during that, too. So, you know, when we're when we're afraid or we're feeling vulnerable. The horse, as long as you acknowledge that one of these more therapeutic oriented, healing oriented horses will come back over and actually do what Stephen Porteous would call co-regulating you. The horse will reach out and be present with you and connect with you in the midst of this authentic emotion. So there's so many brilliant things that horses do emotionally. And, you know, that four point method. And then, you know, I, I did some research into various emotional intelligence authors and found some useful definitions of the various emotions that I put into an emotional message chart. And so I teach that as well. And the horses generally respond to those emotional definitions so that, you know, negative emotions aren't mistakes. They're not designed to torture us. They are course correcting emotions and they're uncomfortable because they're asking us to change something. If we were comfortable, we wouldn't bother to change something. So when horses teach us how to use emotions as course correcting signals, and then we learn how to move through them and then go back to grazing, your whole life changes. It truly changed my life just that one piece let alone all the other wild things i've learned over time with them let's go back to this four points um can you wh what are the four points of that constellation and can you walk us through how they progress sure so the first step is you feel the emotion in its purest form rather than suppressing it you actually notice that it's there yeah the next thing you can do is you get the message behind the emotion. Then you change something in response to the emotion. You take its advice on some level, and then you let it go and you go back to grazing. So in okay. the case of fear, a horse would say, I feel fear. 
And horses can transmit fear at a distance to each other. I've been in that position where I've yeah. felt it. Yeah. So I, you know, horse says, okay, I'm feeling fear. And then what is the message behind fear? Well, there's a threat in the environment. Mm -hmm. So you go, what's the threat? What do I do to move to safety? And then, so you get the message, what is the threat? And then you move to safety is the third step. Um, so the first step is feel the emotion. The second step is get the message behind the emotion. The third step is change something in response to the emotion. So yeah, I see there's a lion walking up. I get the message. Yes, this lion is on the prowl. Now I'm going to run. And then when I get to a position of safety, I'm going to let it go. And I'm going to go back to grace. Horses, as far as I can tell, don't stay up all night debating why God invented lions. They just like, oh, the lion's on the prowl. He's a threat. Let's run. They get far enough away and they get their sentinels up who are ready to, you know, protect against the lion. And then they just all lean down and start grazing again. It's brilliant. Yeah, it is. I've, I've, I've observed the same behavior in um, hunted deer getting away from wolves or, or, or other, other predators, predator prey things where let's say an animal was pursued quite hard, sometimes was even grabbed, but got away. Um, sometimes what one will see is a sort of shuddering off of the, or the cortisol, all of the stress hormone. But then, as you say, they don't then go for 10 years of therapy. They return to their previous behavior pretty quickly. Right. So it, 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 is, is the great lesson that we're learning from horses here resilience? Yes, absolutely. Resilience. And they are, they are, they can also be in states, put in states of learned helplessness or appeasement or, you know, certain kinds of post-traumatic stress reactions you'll see in horses. Right. But when there's, when there's, there's a shift in the environment and a real connection with somebody who truly understands how to help them move through this. They generally move through these things much quicker than the average human does. Yeah. So no, I, they are I, I, more resilient. I would agree. And, and interestingly, um, having spent so much time with hunting and gathering people, I have seen them undergo great trauma. Um, you can imagine some of the unpleasant things that happen to people in those situations when other people are trying to come in and get their land and so on. And what I've observed every time is, is, is an extraordinary resilience where they don't lose their quality of life. They don't use their, lose their playfulness. They don't lose their ability to be happy. Um, and you say, well, why not? You know, this, this terrible thing happened to you again. It's not the first time. And they're like, well, yes, but right. we grew up, you know, dodging elephants and lions. And we do accept that yeah, if it reaches a certain point, it becomes untenable and we will shut down. But until that point arrives, we will be resilient. And I learned much from them because they had at their core of their culture, if they're lucky, you know, a shaman, a healer who's trained to go into an altered state of consciousness and, you know, help with this process. I wonder if in our society where, of course, you know, we went through the witch burning centuries we sort of put to death anybody who male or female who knew anything about herbs let alone could access the spirit world um and so we broke that tradition but having been around say not just the kalahari sun bushman but also you know for example you know horse and reindeer shamans in mongolia um th they have this and they're using the power of the horse do we have with horses a shaman in our midst? Do we have a healer in our midst when we're lucky enough to be part of a horse culture, even if it's, you know, a sport horse culture in a barn? And then here's a question. If we do have this shaman in our midst, if the horses um, heal us in this way, showing us this resilience, walking us between these worlds, how do we not be parasitic on them? How do we make sure it's symbiotic? with all our intense monkey stuff that we tend to bring to things? Well, I think, you know, horses lure you back into a deeper connection with nature and being mm. present. Um, they're, they're transforming us uh, just from that action alone and causing us, if we, if we will sit in the presence of horses and allow them to influence us, 
we begin to feel and hear and see things that we're disconnected from. And so we feel connected to a much larger vision of the universe that's fully aware and conscious and in some sense benevolent in so many ways. And we begin to notice things. And, you know, you just reminded me, and I, I was looking this up as you were talking about, you know, because I'm a, I was a music major and I, I also bring music into a lot of the workshops too, because it's a form of nonverbal communication. It opens creativity and mind body awareness, but there's all kinds of musical mysticism associated with the fact that the ancient Greeks were more obsessed with what they called the music of the spheres, the music of the stars and the planets. It's actually, you can't really hear it or feel it unless you really slow down and become really present. And they were, they were really obsessed with this more than actual music that we make out of instruments or with our voice. And I just saw in this uh, Facebook post recently, a reference to the lost world of the Kalahari and Lawrence Vanderpost was was living amid the Bushmen in the Kalahari Desert. And he describes how shocked they were that he couldn't hear the stars. They actually felt really bad for him, like he had some major disability. And um, so, I mean, horses lead us back into that deep connection with nature where we can begin to feel things we've never noticed before. And then maybe maybe eventually going into these deeper states where you can actually hear the music of the stars and the planets and, and the first ohm that sort of sang the universe into being. So there's all these mystical connections that horses are making for us at any time that we're willing to sit quietly with them. You know, we can do things with them, but I think sitting quietly with them is an important part of accepting the healing potential they have for us and the wholeness that they're offering us. But also I had, um, and I talk about this in my second book, Riding Between the Worlds, and in my book, Way of the Horse, which is a set of horse wisdom cards. My one horse, Rasa, who was really my, my shamanic horse who led me into multiple states of consciousness, she had twins. She had twin bulls. And we, we tried to prevent this. You, you try to prevent horses having twins but somehow the whole thing slipped through the cracks and she ended up having twins born prematurely and one of them was still born and the other one was born so premature that we had to he needed 24-hour care for 10 weeks we had to like put him in a sling so that he wouldn't damage his legs because he shouldn't have been out of the womb yet we had to have him lean up against our body or he would have seizures because he wasn't supposed to be out of the womb regulating his own nervous system yet. Um, we had to milk Rasa and feed this bull who we named Spirit. And so while I was spending lots of time with this bull, I would, I would pretty much spend the night with them. And I would have this bull up against my, my body so that my nervous system would, would stabilize his. And then Rasa would literally stand over me in the stall and, and I would fall asleep and then then... When I would wake up, I would wake up, she would be, you know, sort of hitting me with her hoof like a mare sort of hits their foal to get that foal to stand up and nurse. Well, she figured out that it was me who was going to do it. So then I would have to get up and milk her and then feed this horse and spirit. And I started to reflect on the symbology of twins. And um, I looked up because I'm, you know, us writers, we're always doing stuff like that, right? So you have a thought, then you have to go research it because it feels like it's, it would be an interesting way to, to handle something. And what I found was twins, particularly male twins, are associated with horses in multiple cultures. I mean, it's insane. Hmm. And one of, the, one of the aspects of twin mythology associated with horses is that one, one twin dies and connects the living twin to the other world. And so that okay. it really is. It, it really is about having the ability to access twin forms of consciousness. And um, so now when I teach people to go into what we might call shamanic states, we don't associate it with a particular religion. I use this horse mythology to talk about accessing the twin forms of consciousness, the logical earthly twin with a set location in time and space, and that otherworldly twin that can move through walls and move back and forth through time and space and change form and like 
one of the one of the first journeys we do in workshops where we exercise this ability is we have the p- person become the horse. We have their them connect with this twin form of consciousness and with drumming and some evocative music, actually have that twin human form morph into a horse and then you have an adventure as a horse. And there's a lot of shamanic traditions in horse-based cultures where the shaman becomes a horse during the trance states. So, um, I've, you know, I've even read where some of the shamans have like, um, you know, sort of rings in their shamanic robe where somebody holds a pair of rings as they go into this shamanic state and expand outward into that place where they might also be ridden by a form of spiritual, you know, a spiritual presence of some kind. So what I think the horses are doing is offering at every moment for anybody to learn how to exercise this twin form of consciousness to go into these shamanic states. They're not, they're not just saying, I'm going to do this for you. They're saying, let's do this. Let me show you what you can do. Let me show you where you can go. Let me show you how to access this information yourself. So I think when we, when we have the horse not just take the journey for us, but teach us how to journey in this way ourselves, then everyone has the potential to engage what we would call a shamanic form of consciousness for all kinds of reasons without necessarily feeling like you're going to over-identify as a shaman. But it just seems like the horses are saying, this is a birthright of everybody. Yeah, what the bush means was... What the Bushmen have always said to me is, well, Rune, about 50% of people or more can heal, i.e. access that shamanic state for healing or for hunting magic or for other things that you might need to use it for, plant magic and so on. However, only a, a small minority of people feel a kind of vocational calling towards that and therefore will go on and go through the, you know, many decades of rigorous training that are required in actually doing it, you know, becoming the shaman for the community. But I think you're right. And, and, and something which is interesting from what you say there is, you know, if someone's listening to this and thinking, well, I'm not a horse person. And I think the point that you're making is, yeah, but you don't need to be. Um, you don't need to be a dog person to uh, get a benefit from being around dogs. You do not need to be a musician to access an altered state of consciousness with music. Any of us would know that. You do not need to be a horse person to be able to access this through horses. However, what one does need, because horses are so big and sometimes, you know, unpredictable, is that one does need a guide. One does need a, a, a guardian, a safe keeper to help one interact with a horse if one doesn't have quote unquote horse knowledge. Sure. Another, another of those metaphors in our culture, horse sense, if someone has good horse sense, meaning an ability to, to navigate through life that we, we, we call it that, don't we? Horse sense. Um, and I, I, I think that there's a real, um, benefit for that. If you're listening and you've come this far, you're not a horse person. You think, oh, I wasn't going to listen to this one, but, oh, I've kind of, oh, this is all kind of interesting. Don't think that you need to necessarily be part of the subculture of people that actually ride horses in order to do this. But what you do need to do is, is reach out to somebody like Linda who knows how to intercede between you and the horse so that obviously you're kept physically safe, but you can then access this. Um, the word that comes up for me is paradoxical. We talked about miraculous, but also the fact that you have to go against your own instincts and the horse has to somehow go against their instincts. And then there's this paradoxical miracle that happens where we can meet in the middle and actually do things together as horse and human. Um, in your, in the, Davequus, you talk about um, Pegasus, which is the sort of ultimate miracle horse, the winged horse, which is if, if that's not a metaphor for the ultimate of what is possible, you know, what is. And, you know, Pegasus kind of gets everything right, um, even when Zeus sends the gadfly to sting him and he dumps Bellerophon and he's riding him. He, it's, it's, it's Perseus it goes to the gods and gets a nice home. It's Bellerophon who falls into the ocean. But you talk about Pegasus being born from Medusa's head, which is something I've noticed before in mythology. Again, a rather paradoxical thing that Medusa, who is a Gorgon, who is regarded as the or presented as the sort of destructive element of the feminine, gives birth upon her death 
from the hero Perseus, if I'm co- remembering it correct, to the miracle horse. That paradoxically, she gives birth to this miracle male horse. Pegasus, what's going on in that motif, do you think? What? Well, what? there's a lot of stuff going on there because also um, the reason the reason she was sort of quote unquote pregnant to begin with is she was a really beautiful woman and Poseidon, who who in Greek mythology created the horse, he he created the horse to impress another goddess, Demeter, but that's a whole other story. Uh, so Poseidon seduced Medusa, and when she's beautiful, and then Medusa at a certain point tells everybody that she declares that she's the most beautiful woman, even among goddesses. And then I think it's Venus that gets pissed off and turns her into the Gorgon. So that's part of what happened. Yes, so, it's unfair. Supposedly, basically. yeah. Right, right. <laughs> and so so what you have is a manifestation of, of feminine wisdom in its darkest, most disturbing form, but already being, in some sense, impregnated by the god of the sea, which is associated with the collective unconscious and emotion and all of that. And so then when she, when her head is sliced off by Perseus, her blood drips down to the sea. And I I guess, I think it's where it touches the sea that Pegasus arises. And so um, there's all these themes that are about integration of, of elements, you know, the collective unconscious, emotion, feminine wisdom, and, and feminine wisdom in its darkest, most disturbing form. And all of these things coming together at a certain point to give rise to this kind of redemptive transformational figure of Pegasus. And Pegasus is the white-winged horse, but he's also a companion to the muses. And the muses are those demigoddesses who um, are in control of different aspects of the arts. There's a, there's a muse for music and a muse for poetry and a muse for novel writing, probably, and a muse for dance. And So Pegasus often flies up to Mount Helicon, which is the mountain of the muses. And he hangs out with the muses a lot when he's not carrying heroes around for various purposes. And there's a fascinating myth that's lesser known about Pegasus is that up on Mount Helicon, he actually stomps his hoof really hard on the ground and this earthquake ensues. And as the earth opens up, there's this spring of water that comes out of the center of the mountain of the muses. And that thereafter is known as the hippocrene, which means horse spring. And that water, as it flows down the mountain, actually becomes nourishing to poets and musicians so that people would would climb up supposedly mythologically to the mountain of the muses. And if they were having trouble with staring at the blank page, you would go up and you would sit next to the hippocrene and drink this water, and then you would be filled with this incredible inspiration. So Pegasus is associated with a lot of paradoxes and bringing them together, but also associated with um, making creativity and inspiration available to humans. And I've noticed that that is what happens a lot when people start interacting with horses. It's like something in that hard, logical, earthly life that we've been living that's like you know sort of closed over horses will like kind of shake that loose sometimes in a very gentle way and you feel all of, a lot of times people end up just accessing this and, and, and having tears crying and going i'm not sad and i'm like no it's like the hippocrine rising up creating an oasis for creativity and new growth and so horses literally have that capacity living horses have the capacity to open up creativity and authenticity in people and truly change their lives. I would agree that, you know, I think any of us who are equestrians have had more, we're lucky people because we've, we've, we've had access to more ecstasy, moments of ecstasy, whether it's oxytocin moving through our bodies because our hips are rocking, whether it's because it's, you know, that is mixed with adrenaline, you know, and a certain amount of low level cortisol as we go into a fence and then we have this explosion of energy underneath us. And one of the things I I, I feel is that the horses lend us power. And I I think a lot of people quite rightly outside of the equestrian world and a bit within quite accurately regard a lot of people who are equestrians as kind of assholes because unfortunately, um, horses make us superhuman, right? They lend us. Their power, we're bigger, faster, stronger, more beautiful, 
all of these things until we get off. And then of course we're just little monkeys again. Uh, but what we can f forget is that the horse hasn't lent us this power. It's not power that we own. It's, it's, we might be able to steward it. We might be gifted it, but it's not ours, uh, but we can behave like it is. And of course, with the arrival of, um, interesting with, you know, equestrianism in its classical form into Europe, which happened, you know, somewhere in the bronze age came in through, you know, Anatolia and the fertile crescent in Mesopotamia that had come down from the areas to the north of that. It, the Mediterranean at that time was not really a horse culture, you know, in terms of like it had been up in, in those early horse areas. So we weren't horse tribes growing up in yurts, you know, with a lot of horses around us. So it had to be imported. And the Greeks were the first people to really import it. When you import something, of course, it becomes, you know, expensive. And that means it's for the elite. And we immediately have this association of the mounted man in particular as warrior elite, because of course that came in with these Greek city states, you know, around that time and it's deep in our consciousness, but it goes back before, but there's this interesting thing about what it can bring out in us transformationally para paradox between the worlds, as you said, riding between the worlds. as you, you probably aware of the Norse myth where the gods of Asgard decide they need a wall around Asgard and they're deciding, you know, it's going to cost too much and, and, and who can do this? Well, and then people can do this are giants, but the giants are our enemies. How are we going to do this? So anyway, word goes out and someone shows up. He's a giant in disguise with this big stallion saying, I can build you this wall in just one summer with the help of my horse. And the gods agree. And then they get a bit worried that he looks like he's close to finishing because then they're going to have to pay him. And Loki says, well, let's make sure we... Uh, the, you know, the shapeshifter tricks to God. Let's make sure that we mess him up a bit. So he comes up with the idea of turning himself into a mare. And so he, he changes across the sexes and he lures the stallion away into the woods and makes the stallion mate with him, which of course makes the giant in disguise miss the deadline. So the giants, the, the, the gods get their war mostly built for free can finish it themselves they've outwitted the 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 giant but of course loki goes off and gives birth to an eight-legged horse which becomes odin's mount sleipnir and of course thor realizes what loki's done and, you had sex with the horse oh, and teases him and taunts him and that and loki sort of never forgives him for that what i that's an interesting historic uh mythological paradox for me there do you see a relation between that and the, this integration of female to male energy that's going on with Poseidon and Medusa with Pegasus? Do horses allow those of us who are feminine to access the masculine and they do uh, allow those of us who are masculine to access the feminine? Do they do this for us, do you think? They absolutely do that. Uh, and so I, I think that's why I called my first book the Tao of Equus, because, because they seem to be natural Taoists and they seem to teach us things that if you, if you go to read the Tao Te Ching, sound paradoxical. But when you're with horses, a lot of the things that sound paradoxical in the Tao Te Ching are actually things that you engage simultaneously in your interactions with horses. But another thing that, Lao Tzu, whether he was an actual sage or a group of sages, they're not really sure. Um, Lao Tzu asks us to know the yang, but keep to the yin. Know the masculine, but keep to the feminine. And whether you're a man or a woman, you have to be able to do that to be with horses. You have to know the yang, the masculine active principle, the power principle. You have to know how to be powerful to be in their presence. But for the most part, you need to keep to the yin, the feminine, feeling, connection, mutual support. And so when you're with horses, you actually learn how to do that. Men learn how to access the yin and women learn how to access the yang and to keep those two in a kind of dynamic balance, of course, uh, you know, according to what's needed. So that's, that's really why I called my book, The Tao of Equus. We've talked about a horse that is born from a female male union i.e. Perseus, albeit a bit unfair for poor old Medusa, who, you know, as you say, was 
you know, simply targeted by Poseidon. And then we have some, uh, a horse that comes, it becomes Odin's horse that comes from someone changing their gender, at least moment, you know, for enough time that they can affect that change. Let's talk about horses that come completely from the feminine. Epona, the Celtic goddess of the horse. The Romans arrive in Gaul, we know, which is now France. We know that the Romans in the Republic era, before they were Christianized, had a policy, rather like the Ottomans did, rather like the Persians did, of when they conquered people, they would honor the local gods. They would never force people to um, adhere to their religions with the occasional exception of you have to honor the emperor as a god from time to time as a way of honoring Rome. But as long as you did that and paid your taxes, you know, you can go on. But the, the, the Romans, of course, were famous for bringing cults from up from their conquered countries into their, into their own culture, very successfully, like the cult of Mithras among uh, officers in the military, which came from Persia. We, we had, you know, the cult of Isis was all over um, the Roman Empire. The cult of Epona, they arrive in Gaul, they smash it to pieces. They don't behave well in Gaul at all. And yet they absolutely embrace this Celtic goddess of the horse. What's going on with Epona? Well, there's a whole book now written about the goddess Epona by a man from the UK, I guess. Hmm. I, I just got it in. But from the research that I had done previous, the goddess Epona, a lot of these goddesses or gods that are associated with horses have the capacity to change from horse form to human form back and forth at will. So sometimes you see the goddess Epona as a woman and she's sitting usually side, sideways on a mare um, and there's usually a foal and some of the dog with her. And so I'm seeing this as, you know, the capacity, this is like the ultimate natural horsemanship idea that this goddess is sitting on this mare that has a foal at her side in this really vulnerable position, this very peaceful position, sometimes with a small dog near them. And for me, it, it really is about integrating the predatory and non-predatory power through a feminine archetype, a feminine form of wisdom. Because the horse is, you know, not a predator. So being a, an herbivore and even though it's very powerful, it has a lot in common with feminine wisdom, more sensitive, more feeling oriented, very much relationship oriented. I mean, horses are nomadic. They don't fight over territory. Relationship is more important than territory. So there's a lot of feminine wisdom expressed in the horse itself. And then sometimes the goddess Epona turns into a horse and she can turn into a white mare. And a lot of these, um, cults associated with Epona talk about how they would actually get take a white mare and ask this mare questions and the horse would answer yes or no to all kinds of questions and I have a theory about why that's possible um but in any case the you know as a white mare she's a benevolent horse but if you ignore your true feelings and motivations too long she will sometimes show up in your dreams as this black mare named Melanippe. And in that form, she's like torturing you to sort of give up your, you know, stubborn adherence to things that that are not true or that are overly egotistical. So in some sense, she can turn into what would be known as a nightmare to come mm -hmm. and torture you and make you, make you out of your complacency and your egotism. So there's all kinds of interesting aspects to Epona, but I think if somebody's really interested in this, to look for for the book, and I don't have it handy, it's downstairs. I just got it. And wildly enough, the reason why I ended up coming to my attention is that somebody read the book and told me that I was cited in there as a modern priestess of Epona. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, that's a, that's a wild thing to say, particularly since this author never contacted me. So is this by know, Mackenzie Cook, Epona, Hidden Goddess of the Celts by Mackenzie Cook? That's it. That's okay. it. Right. That's it. And um so, you know, I, I do feel at times like I have been possessed by these blind archetypes. Um there's also the mare headed goddess Demeter. There's a whole story about her turning into the mare headed goddess and 
I, I talk about the mare-headed goddess as also an, a myth associated with transformation, particularly from trauma, particularly from rape. And you can access this essay about the mare-headed goddess in my book, Way of the Horse, Equine Archetypes for Self-Discovery. It's a book of wisdom cards. It's a deck of wisdom cards with significant essays. So if you look in that book, I think it's essay number 35 or something on the mare-headed goddess. And she's a transformational figure for how to transform trauma into strength. And she gives birth to twins as a result of this rape situation she had. So there's this twin element there again. Um, but there are times where I felt like the goddess Apana or the mare-headed goddess, like ride me hard and possess me and make me give up things and do things and write things. And they ride me hard and put me away wet. You know, it's like, you know, please just may I now have a chance to live my life, you know? So, um, almost cathartic. Yeah, I felt like cathartic, like these forces coming in. And I, I I really feel like these goddesses are as as archetypes, they're like non material forms, matrix matrices of wisdom. That, in, that can engage us through their stories and myths about them. But also you can really feel sometimes like that matrix of wisdom is coming in and act, you can have a direct feeling of being engaged by it. And even, I don't ever feel like possessed in the sense of losing my own personal memories, but I have felt in the sense of feeling written by them in a certain direction that I didn't really feel like going in right now, that I didn't consider to be practical. And they wouldn't leave me alone until I actually went in that direction. And then after I do whatever it is they want, then they kind of leave me alone for, for a while. And when I, I didn't think I was qualified to write a book, whatever it was going to be about horses, but I just kept being a, like possessed and having this feeling of write the, write the book, write the story, write the story. And I think maybe these matrices of wisdom, these mythic matrices, of wisdom from the other world are looking for people all the time who might be receptive to a piece of wisdom they want to bring into the modern world again. And they, some people are receptive, um, but they don't have the skills to pull it off. And some people aren't receptive and, and turn it down. And for me, I think the thing that happened that made it possible to be possessed by these equine archetypes of wisdom is that I had the ability to write about things that are not normally talked about because I had been a music critic where I had to write about things that are beyond words. And so, um, and I was also completely overtaken by the magic and the mystery of horses. Uh, and so I think there was a confluence of a calling that a lot of people received and just my capacity to be able to pull off a certain level of getting this wisdom out. What, when did you first become aware of a certain feeling of possession in this way? I do talk about it in the Tao of Aquas. Um, I was spending a lot of time with the horses, and I was still a music critic at the time. And um, I, would just, I would just come to life when I went out with the horses. And I was going into this depressive state writing about music. Okay. And I mean, it was a great career to be a music critic and a music journalists. I got flown all over the world. I met all kinds of famous people. They were sending me their CDs. They were sucking it up to me because they wanted good reviews. It's how I met my husband, Steve Roach, who's very well known in the ambient music field. And But at a certain point, I, I would have to drink an entire pot of coffee just to write a music review. And yet when I went to the barn, I would have endless energy to ride horses in 100 degree heat and I would be filled with all these ideas and I would be writing these endless journals. And so at a certain point, I was like following that energy more and more because it made no sense. I got my first horse in my 30s. It didn't make sense for me to become a professional rider or think about going to the Olympics or something like that. And so I just started having all these adventures. And then I started having these experiences where I felt like I was haunted. And it would just be... It would not only be a feeling of something else surrounding me, some other kind of energy surrounding me and even s disrupting my coordination at times, but I would even have horses that would suddenly spook when I would feel this energy um, and there would be nothing happening in the environment and I could just be on the ground hanging out with them. So I ended up going to this intuitive 
counselor, and I, I do talk about this in the book. Um, her name is Patricia Hirsch, and she had a PhD in psychology, but she had also studied shamanism, particularly with Hawaiian shamans, Hawaiian medicine women in particular. And um, so I just thought, you know, either either she's going to put me on medication or check me into a mental ward or whatever, but I'm just going to go in and see what's going on, you know, because it was driving me crazy. It was keeping me up at night. I was, I was becoming a nervous wreck. And um, so I was just going to be coy about this for a few sessions, but just something about the way she was, I just blurted out, you know, I'm here because I seem to be haunted. And she goes, oh, okay, well, let's take a look at that, you know? And I said, I'm not really sure whether this thing is a product of my imagination. Am I going crazy or is it an external force? Am I really being haunted? And if I am, is it, is it benevolent or malevolent? I just really don't know. And she said, yes, you know, these are very serious concerns. You know, I once let a troubling entity in my life and, and it's more trouble than you'd ever want to have. I mean, she just talked so normally about this experience. And so going through this experience, she helped me access my own intuition and connection to this force. And at first we were like, is this a human? Is this, it seemed to be awakened by and oriented toward the forces. So I'm like, is this, you know, and I, I have a background from Ukraine and I have, you know, probably even some Mongolian blood in me too. So maybe I have, you know, ancestors that were in the early horse cultures in that region possibly Quite likely and i'm like is this an ancestor you know but what what we as we kept going deeper and deeper and deeper into it we realized that it was that complex of horse wisdom that i now call the horse ancestors and so it was it was like the collective wisdom of the horses um and and i learned how to access it and i learned how to use it in different ways and to teach it to others. And I also learned how to use it even for problem solving. So it can even act as like a translation program between the horse mind and the human mind if you access the horse ancestor. So these are some things that I teach in workshops and some things I talk about in my books, but I always put it in, in the perspective of the fact that it's um, it's exemplary of how horses are so that that's an embodied spirituality, so that you must be fully present and capable of being in this world and at the same time accessing these other forms of wisdom. And over time, I've seen that horses, I can't tell whether they're really good at moving back and forth between these twin forms of consciousness, the fully present in this world and spiritual sources, let's say, or if they are in both simultaneous tell. Either way, they are helping us to learn how to do that too. Yeah, I would, I would, I, I agree. I, th I find that when one is around horses in any way, riding with them, doing it, what is one doing but solving problems? You know, when you're going across, when you're simply balancing yourself on, on the horse is pro solving a problem. Getting across country on a horse is solving a problem. Figuring out how to get the poo through the mud onto the wheelbarrow so that the wheelbarrow doesn't tip and tip all the poo into the mud and get it up the, onto the top of the muck heap and do that. That's a problem. And, and one is constantly faced with these interesting, but entirely absorbing, because if you don't solve this problem, you can't get to the next thing of where you're trying to get to with the horse. As you say, horses carry us. I want to bring you back to something you said, you said when, when people were, um, consulting these white mares in, in the Gaulish Celtic, um, shrines. Um, and the, they would ask the mayor almost like an oracle. You said you had some theories about how they might have interpreted what the horse did or didn't do for getting their answer. What, t t t tell me your theory there. What, what do you feel was going on? Well, it actually doesn't take that long to explain. So. Here's the thing is I mentioned earlier that uh, there's been studies that you can read about in the book, Social Intelligence by Daniel Goleman, that show that when you're suppressing an emotion, and I would say also a thought or a perspective or a desire or whatever, when you suppress something like that, it 
takes extra energy to hold it down and it causes your blood pressure to rise and it mm. all causes the blood pressure of others interacting with you to rise also. That's been proven. This happens to people unconsciously all day long. When you make something that's unconscious conscious, whether it's an emotion that you're finally saying, yes, I actually am afraid, or if you're saying, I actually don't want to become an attorney, I'd rather be an artist, whatever it is, whenever you bring up the thing that's been suppressed, it causes your blood pressure to drop even before you've, even before you've solved it in any way. You know, that's why when the la young lady who was crying, the horse walked away. And when she was accessing the anger underneath it, the horse came back to her and surrounded her and comforted her. How did the horse tell the difference between those two? And I think it has to do with this nervous system activation. When you're suppressing something, it causes your blood pressure to rise. When you access it consciously, your blood pressure drops and it's going to drop in the horse too. And the horse will often show that. I see this, you've seen it, where when a person accesses an authentic feeling or thought or calling, the horse will lower their head and lick and chew and sigh. Yeah. I see it all the time. So I think that's what was going on okay. is that people would come up and ask the horse questions about, and it was always yes or no questions. And they would say the horse would indicate through their behavior, whether it was a yes or a no. So I think a no would just be a horse standing there looking stoically, you know, or maybe walking away. And a yes would be the horse lowering their head and licking and chewing. Yeah, maybe yawning. Yeah, yeah, I, I could see that. Here's another question back to the idea of paradox. So goddess Epona, as you say, depicted usually in a peaceful manner. Why would then the goddess Epona get co-opted by the Roman military to the point that pretty much every cavalry unit where they found archaeological evidence that there was a cavalry barracks in a certain place. They always had, after, after the conquest of Gaul, they always had an altar to Epona. And they also would have an altar to the spirits of the, um, of the training ground. If you like the, we, we have this even in American high schools, like school spirit, like the, but they, they regarded them as actual spirits. Um, and right near where I live in Germany, they're actually, and up on Hadrian's Wall in England too, they found round pens from Roman cavalry units uh, where they were, you know, training the horses almost always with altars to Epona close by. So they've now taken this feminine thing. I guess you're right. There's also the, the darker feminine, the, the black mare who might come psychically, but then male. And we know that the Roman military was hyper male energy takes this and co-opts it for the use of cavalry and in their universe they they do it successfully to the point that they promote it as a motif you know th th through the regiments um what do you think is going on there again we're, we're talking about paradoxical natures and transforming in yin and yang but that's really quite, almost quite violent, quite a violent co-opting. Um, and why would the horse ancestors or the, the opponent spirit, if you like, allow that to happen? If we believe that there's a certain animus in these motifs within, with, yeah. Well, what, what's your theory there? I'd be interested to know. Well, the Romans believed in God's and goddesses and would often reach out to a certain goddess for protection. I think that's pretty much all they were doing. Uh, you know, protection for not just themselves, but protection for their horses. She mm -hmm. would certainly be protecting the horses. Mm -hmm. So they would be invoking the goddess for protection for, for themselves and their horses. And, and the reason why a goddess... I, from my perspective, I mean, I can't, I can't really speak for something that complex and spiritually oriented and ancient beyond belief. Uh, but the feeling is, is that, you know, you guys are running through your adolescent fantasies of, of power. And if you invoke me and you start to listen to me and you start to open up to me, I'm going to help shift that and balance that. So. You know, um, I would say that 
that would that might be her motivation. It would be first of all to sh- truly protect the horses, you know. So if they're invoking her and putting up, you know, uh, tributes to her and statues to her, she's at the very least going to protect the horses. There's no question. But I think also this feminine archetype of transformation. She's a she's a an archetype of transformation. And so what she would be doing is seeing how, what an end she can get to, to help to ship things. Yes, I, I could, when you were saying that, or goddess, mounted war goddess came into my mind, which of course the Valkyries, you know, the Valkyries come down to choose the uh, slain from the Norse battlefields. If you died with your sword in hand, they'll take you up on their horses to Valhalla, to Odin's horse. I sometimes think that actually my wife, Ileana, moonlights for Odin on Sundays sometimes and goes in on the same battlefield and takes them up to her. But she's a bit dark on the subject, but I suspect she does do it. Uh, And um, there is a warrior goddess who you're not invoking the Valkyries for success in battle. You're invoking the Valkyries for transformation from the battlefield to the next stage. I wonder if, and of course, as you, I think you're dead right that if you're a cavalry unit, you would absolutely want protection for your horses. Otherwise, you can't operate, right? If your horses are not doing well, you, your, your, your military kit is not working. But beyond that, if you're a cavalryman, you have a connection to your horses. Um, so there's always going to be an aspect of the feminine there, whether you like it or not, there's going to be. Is what Epona is doing in, in that regard a sort of sneaky way in? to say to these guys, look, you may or may not have even chosen to be here uh, because God knows every soldier that shows up on a battlefield is not elected to be there by any means at all. Um, But yet here you are. Um, Let's make the best of the situation and at the very least um, uh, convey you to the the next world or to the next stage in a way that brings peace. Is it, again, is it paradox? Is it the peacemaker within the war machine? Is that what Epona's is doing? I would say the latter. That's, that's what resonates inside of me. That's what causes my heart to expand when you say that. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, they're, the horses themselves appear to be, you know, they, it's like they've been waiting for centuries for us to work out our adolescent fantasies of power and conquest. Mm. And, and, you know, I often say that now that they're no longer obliged to work in our fields and carry us to war, they're finally free to do something arguably more important. And I believe was their mission from the beginning, work on us. And so, and I think part of that involves um, rebalancing, helping us Know the yang, but keep to the yin, as Lao Tzu would say. Uh, bring the feminine wisdom back in. Understand how to be powerful, but also be non-predatory at the same time. That's a huge piece of horse wisdom. And, you know, that physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional balance that you learn when you become a really fine rider. This is like them working on you for sure. You know, you, you, you transform from the inside out if you become a truly great rider. And it's just, it, 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 it is almost like, you know, when you talk about the horse in multiple myths as being a gift from the gods, yeah. um, it's like they, they were a gift from the gods and we didn't really know what to do with it. And, and yet they've been accompanying us for, for centuries and enduring our ridiculous exploits, but always there, always there, always there, just waiting for us to be open to this new form of consciousness that they would love for us to step into. It's, it's very interesting, you know, with the, the method that we've evolved working with autistic children, which we call horse boy method, which evolved simply out of me observing that when I had my son in front of me, when he was very young and he was nonverbal, the more collected, softly collected the rhythm of the horse, the more communication I got. And I didn't know why until I went to talk to, um, neuroscientists about it and have them explain that what was going on was hip rocking, creating oxytocin, oxytocin being 
the feel good hormone calming down the nervous system, but also the hormone of communication. And he was just being flooded with this and, oh my gosh, okay, that's wonderful. But what's intriguing to me again, paradoxically, is that the training system that we use to bring this uh, collection, this movement of the center of gravity under where the rider sits with the hind legs coming forward to create this hip rocking blissful feeling is of course training the horse for the light cavalry. And, and it occurred to me that we were using a system that was designed to harm your fellow man now because of this oxytocin byproduct to heal your fellow man. But the horse was an innocent either way. The horse could lend its power to one, whichever way one decided to go with that. Um, and this humbled me massively because it made me realize how generous horses are. And I, th I wonder, what do you feel about this? We, we, we talked about higher self earlier. I feel that this generosity that horses have with humans, allowing us to, as you say, our silly monkey adolescent fantasies, you know, projected through millennia of conquest, not just a few years of our human history. And yet they've been patient with us, you know, and given us all this bliss and all this joy. Do you feel that they bring out generosity in the human heart? I do. And also equanimity, you know, this, uh, this ability to be present with what's happening and to move through it with some level of agility. I mean, horses are very much like Jay Krishnamurti. He was a famous sage who was discovered in India. And uh, later in life, he went around the world doing lectures on mindfulness and various forms of spirituality. And was very revered as a almost supernatural teacher. And he was at a lecture one time in Europe, I think it was. And people were asking him questions. And finally he said, you know, do you want to know my secret? And everybody was like, oh, good. We signed up for the right lecture because he's going to tell us his secret. And he said, I don't mind what happens. And that's an extreme state of equanimity. No matter what's happening, I'm present with it. I can, but also I, I feel like it's, it can also be seen as a play on words. I don't mind what's happening would be, I'm not exclusively in the thinking brain about it either. Because his, his, a lot of his teachings was about going beyond words, going into the power of what you can learn by being silent and how you can listen in silence. And so when you see horses, they have more of that attitude. I don't mind what happens. I don't mind if you're angry. I just want you to know that you are. I don't mind that you're, you know, that you're traumatized. Um, I, let, me, let me help you calm your nervous system. You know, I don't mind that Rowan is autistic. I don't mind that Rowan is throwing these tantrums. Let me come over. I'm with you. I'm with you. I don't mind it. You're okay, Rowan, you know, and I just feel like they do that all the time. And so they show how the, the supreme generosity of horses is, is godlike in a way in which there's nourishment for everybody. Everybody's welcome on the earth. Everybody's welcome. We're, we're working with you. We're trying to help you out here, but we're not taking sides here. And a lot of people recently are constantly um, making the case that God is on their side and not the other side. But, you know, maybe God is more horse-like in the sense that, yeah, so I'm, I'm leading Romans on my back here and I'm, you know, with the Buddha and I'm, you know, helping somebody who's very poor plow their fields and and the whole time just waiting for people to wake up and notice and not use them as tools, but to say, hey, can I learn some of that equanimity? Can I learn how to be authentic and not mind what happens in the paradoxical sense of that word? Beautifully put. All right. As we approach the end of this conversation, because I'd like to have you back on, I've got a lot of questions that are coming to mind so if you'd be 
I up would road. love to come back on. I love uh, talking with you. I'd love to have a round two. And, and there's going to be a ton of questions from people. And I've got plenty of my own, which I, I just want to keep going with it. <laughs> Here's a question, though, back to the live free, ride free idea. You, when you were a little girl dreaming about horses, by the way, what state was that? What state were you brought up in? And where you were? Ohio. You were in Ohio. And then you, were, you would sneak off to where this trainer had a yard but you didn't find your way to horse ownership until you were in your thirties, but you found your way there because you gave yourself a certain economic stability through music, which a lot of people would say is itself, um, you know, not an easy way to find your way to economic stability. What allowed you to imagine life and a career with the arts and then with the horse and bring that to reality? This started before horses were reaching out through you, or perhaps they were the whole time. But yeah, there's, there'll be listeners out there going, how do I become Linda Kohenov? Or how do I become my own version of Linda Kohenov? Um, what would you say to them? What, 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 what's the most important stages of the journey that bring you from the little girl dreaming to the lady sitting being interviewed today? I think part of it was a trajectory that feels designed for me to develop some skills, even though it didn't seem to have my own. It, it was like things happened that were beyond my wildest dreams when I sort of submitted to certain directions that didn't feel like the right direction at times. Mm -hmm. um, and one of those was that, uh, yeah, and just feeling like you're you're being guided in some sense, even though it seems like you're being taken off track. And I realized that those times that I got taken off track, I had to go off track and learn something that I needed later for my true purpose. And one thing, I mean, the reason why I ended up being a music major is because my parents thought it was more reasonable to, to be a music major than it was to do anything with horses. So they were like picking the lesser of two evils. It's like, you know, yeah, get, get her interested in music. And also I got a full scholarship in college to be a music major. And they were like, please take the scholarship, you know, and and then I became a music critic and then met my husband through through music. And um, and then what happened was, interestingly enough, music and horses have always been tied together. So to buy my first Arabian mare, Rasa, who became my greatest teacher and the one who really started this work, I had to sell my viola and most of my CD collection to buy that horse. And so then I had all these adventures with her and then I got an advance to write the Tao of Equus. And so when I got that advance, I used it to buy another viola. And then through all of these years, learning how to be with the horses and interact with the horses and dance with the horses and breed with the horses and learn all of these stress reducing techniques, it actually brought me back into being able to play and compose at a whole new level. So the horses and the music have always been interacting in this very odd way. And it's fun now to, to be in a field where I'm bringing the two together. We just did a workshop last week, a four-day workshop called Nada Brahma, the universe's sound. And it brings in some of the mystical aspects of music, the self-development and healing aspects of music, along with work with the horses. And there were mostly people there who didn't know anything about horses. And they were amazed at how the horses opened them up and shifted things so that they could actually step forward and play at a much more beautiful level. Even if they weren't musicians themselves, somehow the work with the horses gave them even the courage to begin to, to make music together. So somehow the two are truly inter interacting all the time for me. Well, I guess, I guess what lies at the, at the, core of riding and training horses rhythm right we have to be able to match the horse's rhythm we have to be able to it's an emotional rhythm but there also has to be a physical rhythm yeah one two three four for the walk one two one two for the trot one two three one two three for the canter and these have to be predictable enough through our training system that we can then do things with them and not be surprised by arrhythmic things that might as you say leave us in the dust or at the very least break the activity we're trying to do <laughs> If one thinks of all these musical motifs around horses, the, the shaman's drum, ba -da 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 -dum, ba -da 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 -dum, you know, the round drum, the boran in Celtic traditions, which is a galloping horse, 
baroque music, da da dum 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 da 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 dum dum, which was designed to be done to these equestrian shows with the horses, you know, performing in this way in front of Versailles and these other, you know, palaces of Europe. Um, that music and horses, it's it's been a concurrent theme and rhythm forever. Yet at the same time, what comes in what comes into my head is this also this relationship with horses and dream and the imagination. And it resonates with me very much that there was this little girl in Ohio who was dreaming. Although I can absolutely see the connection between music and rhythm with the human horse connection and the adventure that we've gone on over the centuries with that, it seems to me that this vehicle, horses lending themselves to our dreams, our aspirations, our fantasies are whether for good or ill um but yet this thing of dream and that there was this little girl in ohio who was dreaming and she was dreaming of these animals that seemed to have this ability to bring one into dream and then bring one out of dream with dreams somewhat manifest is this something which if someone was to come on your courses, for example, they could learn how to tap into it and um, harness? There's another horse motif. Yes, exactly. Absolutely. That's, that's, that's the purpose of what I teach. I mean, I don't really, I mean, I, I teach emotional and social intelligence and leadership skills to equestrians that help their riding and training at times. But most of what I do is we work with horses to teach advanced human development skills to people, whether or not they've ever thought about horses before. And and we also bring in, you know, creativity and we bring in emotional intelligence skills and and leadership skills. Because, you know, here's the thing is that once you access your true calling and your authentic goal in life. A lot of times to manifest that, you need to be able to step into a leadership role if you're going to manifest it in any meaningful way. And so a lot of times we teach also some some leadership skills through working with horses so that people who dream big dreams and access those dreams learn how to then manifest and, and be a leader in maybe a new field they're creating or a new company they're creating. Um, so, and that was one of the things that, you know, was kind of disturbing to me when when I wrote these books um, about what horses have to teach people is that now all of a sudden I, I'm, a, I'm in a leadership role. If I'm going to take it to any certain level, I need staff people. I need, you know, promotional people. I need when people come to see me, I need to be able to manage whatever they're going through. Uh, but the horses taught me how to be a leader in a completely different way than the way you normally see it in a conquest oriented mentality. So, so there's so much to learn from them. And I'm just so excited to be in this field that I actually helped to bring into form, just like you with your horse boy programs. And certainly Rowan was, was there to help that happen as well. And, and I feel that way about my horse, Rasa, who actually she was wounded. She had a condition in her right back stifle that made it hard to ride her. And because I was knocked off my high horse and had to relate to her on the ground, that's what created this whole field. So a lot of times it's someone who appears to be wounded that is actually the one who's leading us into a whole new area of experience and innovation. I would agree. The wound is where the light shines in. Absolutely. Um, and yeah. Absolutely. I've, and I've, I've had a couple of horses that could no longer be ridden who taught me how to work in entirely different ways and um, allowed me to see that as metaphors for other areas of my life where perhaps I was stuck, only seeing things in a certain way. So listen, Linda, people are going to want to know the books and they're going to want to know how to come on one of your courses. Um, and I presume they're going to have to travel to Arizona to come on one of your courses. Is that right? Or can they do them? They can also do them online, I think. So talk us yes, to yeah. what, what people need to know. What should they read? In what order? And then how do they come on one of your courses? How do they contact you? How do they do it online? How do they do it in person? 
Well, luckily, I, I have trained instructors all over the world, and they're opponent quest instructors, or we also have a leadership model called the five roles of a master herder. Um, so some of them are master herder instructors or power of the herd instructors that have more of a leadership orientation. Opponent quest instructors are really more of a personal development orientation. Uh, and also, I was able to create these online courses so that you know, if you can't travel anywhere right now or you, you're just not ready to go out with the horses, you can learn these skills with inspirational stories and videos from the horses, but it's really about taking it directly to the human world. So my online courses are available on a website called lindacohana.com. And the other courses that are about doing workshops would mostly be on my website eponaquest.com named after the quest I've been on with the goddess Epona eponaquest.com and you'll see not only workshops that I'm doing on there but you'll see a list of instructors throughout the world and you can con you can find somebody in your region and call that contact that person and see if they're doing private or group work or workshops anytime soon um so if you know if you if you're really curious about which way you should go I would say just I can I can give you my direct uh, email, and you can always just write a note and just say, "Hey, this is my interest. What do you think I should do? I'm located here. How do I, you know, what do you what would you recommend for me to sign up for?" Uh, so what is that email? Yeah, direct. Email, it's it's named after my horse Rasa, so that's R as in Ralph, A as in Apple, S as in Sam, A as in Apple, Rasa at eponaquest.com. So that's E P as in Paul, O N as in Nick, A Q U E S T dot com. Rasa at eponaquest.com. And you can go to eponaquest.com and just kind of like look at the workshops that are coming up. Uh, and then the online courses are at lindacohadam.com. But if you go to eponaquest.com, there is a link there that will take you to that online course page too. So super now I'm I'm gonna I'm going to read those off again in a moment so people who didn't have a pen handy can hear them again. So don't worry, people don't panic. Um, the books. Um, in order, Tower of Equus. Then Riding Between the Worlds. Riding then, Between the Worlds. Yes. Then? Then Way of the Horse. Way of the Horse. It's a deck of horse wisdom cards with a significant book that goes with it. Right. Then the power of the herd. And then finally, the five roles of a master herder. The five roles. Yes. Of a master herder. And this is actually something you and I might want to have fun talking about, because I would love to hear your experiences with these nomadic tribes, the horse tribes and the reindeer tribes. Um, I took this leadership model from studying those nomadic pastoral cultures throughout the world in different ways. And I saw that they actually use five rules of power and social influence to, to deal with these animals that many of whom are loose quite a bit of the time. Yes, absolutely. Um, and so leader, leader is just one of five rules of power and social influence. And so I learned that if we're going to influence groups of free and powered people as all the old fences of social controls are falling down, that we could actually learn a lot from this model based on those nomadic pastoralists. I mean, we could have such a conversation on that. And I would be asking you a bunch of questions for sure. I'd love it. There's, there's someone else I'm thinking of that I, I would involve in it. Who's my friend, Jumanda Hakleboni, who is from Botswana. He's, he's Lanakwe Bushman. Um, and that particular clan in the central Kalahari game reserve are known for their horsemanship. And then over having sort of adopted and co-opted horses in the same way that say the Comanche did, uh, and really created a sun Bushman horse culture, um, to the point that I took him fox hunting in Virginia and he could ride anything and he could bring, you know, I had a lot of, you know, white blue blooded fox hunters. They're going, really, we're going to give the horse to this guy. I'm like, believe me, he's going to bring this horse in better than it went out. And they absolutely didn't how they access the shamanic and how they access, how they um, co-opted all their wild herbs that they use for all their other medicinal purposes for the horse before they really knew that, even without really knowing the horse and how they created this horse culture 
it's 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 interesting stuff. But look, there's so many questions just generally. I I think we got to have a, a round two. Absolutely. And if you want to bring your friend in on this too, I mean, that would be thrilling. It would. I mean, we might not be able to get him on live, but maybe what we can do is post some questions to him and 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 get him get him there because who knows where he is in the Kalahari at any given time. Oh, I see. Okay. He'll usually right. he'll usually answer a WhatsApp at a certain point when he's at a place where he has. It's 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 an extraordinary world we live in now. You have you know people living effectively hunter gatherer lifestyles with cell phones. You know, it, 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 we're at an interesting crossroads of our culture. Um, okay, so for everybody listening, start with the Tower of Equus. Then it's riding between the worlds. Then way of the horse. Then the power of the herd. And then the five roles of a master herder. If you want the online courses, lindakohanov.com, L-I-N-D-A-K-O-H-A-N-O-V.com. If you're looking for the live courses, whether in your area or in Arizona, where she is, hopefully, I'm sure there's a big waiting list, eponaquest.com, E-P-O-N-A-Q-U-E-S-T. Dot com, And if you want to send her your questions, R-A-S-A, Raza, at EponaQuest.com. Is there anything that you'd like to add before we close out round one? No, I'm just so grateful to be able to connect with you. And your your story has been so moving to me over the years. And I had an opportunity just to meet up with you at, at Warwick Schiller's conference and I got to meet Rowan and I think you might have seen how in shock I was at what an outstanding young man he has turned out to be in so many ways. And so I found that so moving and I'm just so happy to meet up with you and have these great discussions. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. You know, that, that makes me think, actually, you know, for our round two, we should absolutely ask Rowan some questions that fine because he has he does have a really interesting connection to horses while by no means being the obsessive horseman that i am at all and yet he has this connection it it's it, to, and not just to horses all animals it's it's really extraordinary so yeah maybe we should think up some questions and and he might even come on live see how he feels he'll actually be um yeah he'll be, he'll be here in a couple of days um okay. listen linda i'm so grateful I, I know that I'm going to be emailing you to come out to Arizona. Um, I can't. I would love that. Uh, so please let's talk about that. And obviously, if you come, want to come to Germany and play with our ponies here in the forests of Hessen, please do. Um, maybe, in a, maybe in a year or two, I might come back to Europe. So Please, door is wide open anytime. But listen, we, I'm very grateful. This has been extremely informative, inspirational. I know that all of the listeners, whether they're horse people or not, will have walked away from hearing you with the doorways between the worlds opened. So I thank you for that. Thank you. And I look forward to the next time. Me too. This is the hardest thing. I'm going to hit that red button, but let's let's talk further and try to arrange the round two and everybody who's listening by all means send your questions to me by all means send your questions to linda and we will endeavor to answer them on round two linda thank you all right excellent all right. thank you thank you for joining us we hope you enjoyed today's podcast join our website newtrailslearning.com to check out our online courses and live workshops in horseboy method movement method and athena these evidence-based programs have helped children, veterans, and people dealing with trauma around the world. We also offer a horse training program and self-care program for riders on longridehome.com. These include easy-to-do online courses and tutorials that bring you and your horse joy. For an overview of all shows and programs, go to rupertisaacson.com. See you on the next show. And please remember to press subscribe and share.